This, I go, I could do that. And then he's like, I could do this. And I go, I could do that too. And after like the fifth time, he's like, oh, this just. I actually use these buttons, you know. Right, right. It doesn't really have those keys. Right. Like on, on on the windows, I could have this open, this open. I could have, I could have, I could have like another one open, and then if I hit the off like this Windows D, it dumps everything to desk. Um, one time I had this one, this one presenter, she had like. I swear to God, like 20 windows open on the map. We're going to sit there one by one. Yes. Are you being So I'm getting levels for something. Yeah, nothing on here. Oh, Yeah, I'm just getting a second. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, remote so I don't know whether a leader I want to torture everybody with like okay everybody's already attended so we get started Ask the crowd to
Testing. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Okay. I think we're ready to get started if you all want to have a seat. All right. Well, welcome to the uh, hardware management session in the, in the OCP uh, engineering workshop. I'm Norm James with IBM, and this is... Uh, I'm Bernie Meyer with Ericsson. Thank you. So, well, everybody, welcome here to, to Dallas, and uh, hope you made it here okay. So uh, I was just going to do a quick update of uh, some high-level items here. Um, first one is, is uh, I hear that we're getting rid of Fuse. So ooh, everybody clap. Yeah. Okay. So that it's going to be this go-to webinar, um, go-to-webinar.com. So I hear it's uh, idiot-proof. Uh, I guess we will put it to the test soon. <laughs> so we will see. Uh, Oh, okay. Good. So they're using it. They're using, doing a trial run today. Good, good. Okay. Um, also, uh, I know several of... Yeah, Chris. Well, uh, so there will be a calendar invite to the public. So we did the go-to webinar thing. There will be a calendar invite to the Oh yeah. So go to webinar. I assume we'll have meeting invite calendar. Okay, so we'll give it a whirl. Um, also, I know several of you come to the monthly meeting, which is great. We have great participation. Um, I just want to know if there was any feedback or anything we could do better. Um, you think it's going okay? Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Refresh, refresh, and then I get into it, and then I can actually uh, direct Oh, the, the Wikipedia, yeah. Yeah, I choose to forget the name of it. Uh, Etherpad. 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 I've used Etherpad in the past. That was awesome. I love the idea because we can all type at the same time. I don't know what security notes that we have going on, though. Sometimes you just you have to refresh part of the Is there, is there any other? Uh, uh, yeah. One of the features of Go webinars that you will be able to upload. Yeah, it's being recorded, yeah. It's on the, I think it's on, I was going to go to the agenda next, so perfect timing. I think it's on there. Try right here is a uh, yeah on the OC. This is on the OCP com, o, Open Compute website under the blogs. And what about the Wi-Fi password? Oh, that's. Twenty seventeen. Oh, that's so yeah, this is the this is the blog. It looked like the uh, agenda on the DCD website wasn't quite up to date as up to date as this. So 
So go to the go to the OCP website. Uh, but yeah, here's the URL for the um, for the go to meeting thing. So um, first, I guess we were kind of debating on whether to do the panel discussion or not, since a lot of the folks here were are, are part of it. But there are some new faces, so we could we could give it a whirl and see what happens. It might be it's not probably not going to be 50 minutes though, but we can. So do you want to just try it, Archner? We can try the. Panel, yeah, because we got some new, we got a few new folks in here. And remote people. Okay. So uh, that was what we were going to do first. Um, hopefully, you know you're on it. Here's the names of the, the people we think. I guess there's a, Brian's not going to be on it. That was. Okay. 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 Okay, so uh, then we were going to start a group of uh, of different companies giving their uh, some updates on their open BMC developments. Um, we have uh, Chris is going to do IBM, and then I guess uh, CMX going to do Microsoft and Ali. Okay, and then Facebook and Intel and Google. So five of them over 120 minutes. So it's like 20 something minutes each. Um, so. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see if we f can fill up that time. And then after that, uh, um, Jeff was going to do the. Uh, we've been having a lot of the meetings have been focused on the um, Redfish profile and reviewing that. So Jeff was going to do a review uh, of that. Um, I guess kind of a final, maybe a final review, right? Yeah, hopefully a final review. We can put this thing to bed. Um, so that that was the agenda. Any questions or? Okay, well, let's get started. Chris, you're first, right? Oh, the panel, the panel's first. Yeah, the panel's first. Yeah, if you guys absolutely. Because I know um, uh, F Tech here in the back will be recording the panel, so. And I will stand you're over here. You pass the mic, or is there? Yeah, we're gonna pass the mic. I have the conch. Oh, that's okay. You can leave that up. That's fine. You can leave that up. I just need my panel questions. <laughs> we can add a chair. No, no, add a couple of chairs, guys. Yeah, come on. We're open here. We're all open. <laughs> All right, so I think this is on, right? I can't, I can't tell. Okay, so what I wanted to do is have a panel here because OpenBMC seems to be a very hot topic, um, and there are so many different uh, companies represented here that are working on it, and so we wanted to just do a brief discussion on um, what it is, and I want to start with just a brief round of introductions. So if you could take the mic, Bill, we'll start with you. And just pass it down. Just who you are, what company you represent, and yeah, Bill Carter with the uh, the CTO for the OCP Foundation. Chris Austin, IBM. Uh, James Mim, uh, BMC firmware team lead for Intel. Saeed Asari from Facebook. Ali Larjani from Microsoft. Uh, John Leung from Intel, but I also. Um, I'm here representing the Distributed Management Task Force, which does uh, Redfish. Rick Alther from Google. Uh, Sia Mike Tavalai, Microsoft. I'm a co-lead for Server Project OCP as well. So there are two repositories that are currently um, in play, uh, Facebook and IBM. So can we start with maybe you, Sai, at Facebook and talk a little bit about what uh, open, how BMC, open BMC got started and what Facebook's role is in open BMC today? Sure. So back in uh, 2014, we have been using like third party switches. And that's when we started thinking of designing our own switches, the white box switch. Just the way we open sourced the hardware servers storage we wanted to do the networking switch, also open source. So we started design uh, of the switch, 
and typically a switch has this data plane control plane and it doesn't have any BMC but we wanted to manage the switch also just like a server so we looked at the servers what they are doing and then say took the BMC concept and put it into the switch itself putting the hardware is kind of pretty easy like talk to the hardware engineers get the same schematic but writing software for that proved to be a challenge so what we did was initially just went to the same route of our server BMC firmware went to the ODMs and asked can we have a BMC f stack for switch they said it yeah we can have it but it takes six months but we have the system ready to kind of be powered on without, without BMC we cannot even power up the switch so we looked at open source just because IPMI BMC has been there for like a couple of decades like 90s but we cannot find any even a single uh, source code that is open source so we thought why not write ourselves started using the SDK as the beginning uh, like from the speed and used actual Linux as the build system and we started writing our own uh, BMC software and as with the initial finding like there is no open source available so we thought we can start open sourcing it up and then used github to kind of open source it for the first time um, 19 I think 2006 sorry 2016 <laughs> uh, so that's how the open BMC started as a small hackathon project and then uh, right now fast forward to three years we have about eight different platforms using the open BMC and we have about half a million systems being managed by the open BMC deployed in the data centers so that's how we ended up here thank you um, Chris do you want to explain how you got started in open BMC and where you are today sure uh, so IBM is pretty big on open source technologies um, and we actually went and open sourced even the hardware aspects of it and we helped create a foundation called open power um, that's completely open processor all the way up the stack one thing though with the server line is that it did use the proprietary BMC um, so we pushed really hard to say like look around the industry find something out there that does open source already right let's make sure that the BMC itself uh, is it can be written open source and then same thing contribute uh, get contributions from other people we looked around uh, we saw a lot of different options some you know pros and cons for each one of them um, then we uh, we worked with uh, with the Facebook code stack um, and saw and we were able to prove out we got the servers to boot up and stuff and that was really cool there was we wanted to do a couple of, we recognized a couple of different things that needed to to be updated in order for us to, to make it work for our server world uh, and so we created um, that code base from the you know from the the Octo build environment and stuff and then from there it, it just kind of grew and you know kind of kept the architecture very, very straightforward um, created a, an environment where we believe had the technology that allowed other companies to make contributions as well as keep their own technologies kind of in their own house as well mm -hmm. uh, so we, that's where it's at okay. um, and today that repo is in github so if somebody else wanted to take a look at IBM's open you know community and work so far where would they find that yeah sure they'd go to github.com slash open BMC there's a series of repos there one of them is open BMC uh, in there, there's a readme, how to, there's documents, there's guides on how to work with the code, how to run it in a simulated environment. Um, it's all right there. Okay. So there's a lot of collaboration going on. We've got Microsoft, Intel, um, IBM, Facebook, um, Google represented here. And I know you're all collaborating together to try and come up with OpenBMC as something that, you know, the community can use. So if someone wanted to have an open a, a, you know platform that they wanted to work on say a canonical repo how would that work how would the community be able to work with somebody else's repo um, yeah I'll take a, a quick shot at it and then I'm gonna hand the mic off to whoever wants to, to do it because this is totally a community-based thing that's right <laughs> so that, that was intended for the entire panel and <laughs> yeah for inputs. Have, right so <laughs> The, the first thing would be is a, is a, a code repository where everybody can add and uh, get reference code from uh, and then they can make contributions and really we're trying to figure out the rest. That's, that's about it for me. 
So Google got into OpenBMC when we uh, started doing a project with IBM, uh, the Zaius Power9 based system. And we decided we needed a firmware and we wanted to have a, an open source firmware to go with that. Mm -hmm. So we looked around to see what our options were, ended up selecting the IBM OpenBMC and made a commitment to, we're not going to simply be consumers of this. We're going to be active participants in the community. We're going to actually develop a team around it with the intent of do our development upstream. We don't want to carry a lot of maintenance cost internally. We don't want to have a lot of burden. So even though we're going to have a lot of people working on it, we want that all to go upstream so that we're coordinated with everyone else. And so far that's worked out pretty well. There's been some growing pains on, on the internal side of, you know, yes, go in and actually find an IRC client and start it up and be on the IRC channel to be part of the conversation, join the mailing lists, um, send out patches and expect pushback, expect having to explain some of your design choices, start early in your discussions. But what we found is actually we carry very few internal patches now. We're actually able to work with the com upstream community um, and help divide up the work amongst all of our uh, the contributors so far. So when we need a new device driver or we find a bug, we really do fulfill that open source community role of everyone contributes and we all pitch in on supporting the different aspects of the SOCs we're using or the overall core architecture while still having some very specific internal things for our environment. James, Ali, do you want to comment on Microsoft or Intel and your? Yeah, uh, I think uh, in Microsoft, uh, we have defined a strategy that uh, uh, we need to have a standalone uh, uh, hardware manageability and each uh, integral part of the, the, the cloud hardware, including the, the, the compute node or the storage node, will have its own uh, uh, BMC or hardware manageability. So the first strategy that we define that uh, that standalone hardware management solution should be based on the Linux because of lots of opportunity we see uh, from the open source community that we can leverage at the, at the first step. And uh, last year, uh, we started looking at the available open uh, BMC solution out there. And uh, we see a great opportunity to leverage those on a couple of products. So we created a team in Microsoft uh, and they been focused on developing the open BMC and integrate that solution into the, the, the real product. And uh, so far we have seen a, a very good result, a stable solution. And, uh, but at the same time also we are seeing the lots of room for the improvement. And uh, we keep discussing this with the, the, the community to how to plan moving forward to improve the solution to create a solution that's reliable and at cloud scale it address all the uh, uh, critical areas including the, the features, performance, uh, security and availability at the same time. I think uh, we are see seeing that a very good momentum has been created and it means that probably more resources will be available to contribute to make the open source uh, BMC solution, uh, robust and reliable solution for the hardware manageability. Yeah, for for my team in general, since we've been doing BMCs for a long time, this is like a major shift in uh, our thinking, like going from a proprietary stack to open. Uh, there's lots of driving forces behind it. Um, one of them that, that I always embrace is like customers want to know what they got in their BMC. They want to know what kind of security vulnerabilities that they got. Um, uh, and they want to have some, some control in that aspect. Um, and this gives us that opportunity to do that. And for a lot of us up here doing BMC work, we're all solving the same problems and we're doing it over and over and over. So this is a good way for us to get our solutions out there and open. People can throw rocks at it and we can come up with a, the best viable op opportunity for our, uh, our alternative for our solutions and run with it. Uh, it's going to be interesting to work throughout all of our uh, 
constraints and limitations we have as products, but um, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, all these par partners uh, involved here. And I want to thank Facebook and IBM for being the spark that <laughs> caused this to happen, because uh, it's been a long time coming. So. Uh, to complement some of the things I heard, um, from the hardware perspective, from ordering parts, from building a server or storage expansion box, um, from that point of view, um, we thought that having a hardware element that is common in all of those as a BMC is important. But that was not sufficient because if we were to demand that our ODMs built to that particular part without having the firmware running on it that could support not only Microsoft but others, uh, that would be very difficult for ODMs to do. So having the OpenBMC as a future, if you do this, it will be useful. It will energize them to implement the parts that we want and have the uh, eventual motherboards, either for storage devices or for servers, to be usable for people outside of Microsoft. Okay. So I guess my next question is, I know you've talked a lot about the importance of getting together and coming up with a unified version of OpenBMC. As you look out to the OCP community and those that are on the phone as well as those that are in the room, um, and those that will be looking at this video um, online after the workshop is done, what do you think this brings, uh, the, com the commonality in a unified open DMC, what do you think that brings to the OCP community? Um, because they're looking for some unified you know, model here. And my question is, as they look at that unified model, what should they be looking for in terms of features and support? And maybe each of you can take a few moments and talk about that. From a unified open BMC, what would that look like? Does that make sense? I see head nods, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start? OK. Yeah, I can start. So from uh, OCP perspective, I see two kinds of people coming in. One is uh, people who are using open BMC, like say sysadmins and users. So from their point of view, they just want to look at OpenBMC as what it can offer me, like what kind of tools, what is my uh, user interface is going to look like. Can I integrate it with some other third-party software? That's what their intention is uh, for some of the people. And there is another community which is like a developer community. People, as James was saying, there are a lot of people who are working on the BMC's firmware stack mm -hmm. proprietary for 20 plus years or 30 years nearly. For them, I think they want to look at they don't want to spend their time again and again doing the same thing over and over. While they move to co different companies or different products, they don't want to do the, repeat the same work. Can we do it one time and then reuse it for all other future products? So I see these two different aspects is what I think this common uh, unified BMC can bring it to the OCP. Okay. Yeah, one thing I want to add to that is that uh, I view like the BMC man manageability that we're doing, like even today, uh, the baseline of it is a commodity functionality and feature, and people want to pay as little as possible for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, having an open BMC where we're all having a common baseline and, and uh, try to reuse as much as we can, we can focus on innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big value adds I see in this, not only by us, I mean by us system manufacturers like for Intel, but like all the, the vendors and the suppliers out there. They want to add a card, they want to add a uh, peripheral, they have, a, they have a platform that they can start with. They can develop it and they can get their products to market faster and we all can start using it faster. And uh, that, to me, that's a big plus. Sure, from an OCP's perspective, uh, with everything that's been said so far just makes complete sense, right? Uh, any person within OCP now has a voice, now has a way to get a feature request that can be done in the best place if it can be done on a BMC and you say, hey, this is where it needs to be done in order to get my features in, you now have an avenue to get that feature request rolled up, right? Uh, I think we have the ability now uh, to get features out faster in a consistent way. Um, I think we have the ability then to go to other um, organizations like 
DMTF or Redfish, and we'll actually be able to provide uh, an implementation of a design that we've been asking for. We're looking for a schema for Redfish, and it's great on paper, and let's put it into, into practice, because now we actually have the tools to do it. We have a tools from OCP to be able to say, this is the schema that we'd like, and by the way, here is a, is a request to push it in through the code uh, to see it in implementation. I think when you create a design but you don't have the ability to write the code for it, you, you get to a point where now you're limited and you're requiring, you need other groups to, to do that support. Well, the, there's a whole bunch of people right up here that's actually going to be doing that code support to help us out. And so, a couple of things I just want to add. Uh, Having a unified solution uh, for BMC actually uh, helps to, to improve the learning curve for the development. That's one of the aspects that's very critical versus uh, having multiple solutions out there and uh, the, the ODM are working uh, on the different hardware at the same time. They have to support multiple platform, but having a unified uh, BMC solution actually should help with the time to market and for the product development. And the other aspect is working on a, on a common solution. Actually, we can uh, leverage the expertise across the whole industry that comes from the different companies, from the different backgrounds, from different experiences, that at the end it should help to improve the, the solution of the hardware manageability. I uh, spent a lot of time actually meeting one-on-one -on -one with uh, large enterprise customers coming to OCP events and was asking them, what is actually holding you back from deploying OCP equipment in your own environments? And a lot of them said, well, we're testing it. I said, right, but what's stopping you from deployment? And often the answer was, well, I get a rack of equipment and then what? The, the next phase of actually doing the deployment and the health monitoring and all these higher level pieces of, yes, I got the equipment there, I landed it, I connected it, and now I turn the power on, what happens? They didn't know what that next step was. I see OpenBMC as adding the first step of that solution. It provides us common foothold in each machine that we can build upon to add that next level of services up there so that when you get your rack of OCP machines, now you actually have the ability to manage that. And since we're leveraging the expertise of companies that work at massive scale and have the expertise of, this is how you actually identify when machines are no longer behaving correctly. This is when I, how I take control of a machine and reinstall it if I need to. This is how you do that when you have tens of thousands of machines. And ex bringing that expertise down to the BMC level where the standardization hasn't quite happened yet. That provides that platform so that these large enterprise customers have a path. They'll be able to buy the equipment, then they'll be able to manage the equipment. So the next question, did you have, did you want to add? Please. Just to reiterate that uh, having a unified code base or an upstream that everybody can contribute to will build more robust solutions. It takes a lot of eyes and ears and brains to work on the same code path. As everybody said, expertise from different angles will add to it. And maybe the first generation will be buggy, but the second generation will be almost perfect. So I guess my next question, oh, did you want to? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So one of, the, one of the big value adds I see in this too is, along with robustness, is security. I know that, that's big on our plate, mm -hmm. everything we do you know, we have, we, uh, that's the first thing on my mind is how somebody can uh, uh, exploit a vulnerability in the BMC. I'm, I'm surprised we haven't heard more about it, um, which I hope is because we've been doing a good job. But um, <laughs> having an open BMC solution is, you know, it, it's scary and exciting at the same time. Uh, it's scary that people are going to look at your code and you got to make sure it's clean. Uh, but hopefully we'll get a a better and a, a nice secure solution out there that we all can benefit from. I really loved your response. Uh, 
what I said was there are a lot of smart people that are going to make contributions, and you immediately said from your point of view, security was important, awesome. Somebody else might come in and say, hey, fault tolerance is important for me, awesome. So it's just, and somebody else with some, some other aspect that's very important. All will pile up into a wonderful unified solution at the end. So my next question is actually to John Leung, who's sitting very quietly. <laughs> uh, you've been involved in hardware management, so I'd like to kind of hear what the DTMF perspective is on OpenBMC. Well, well, for one, I personally am not involved in any OpenBMC project at all. And so from a DMTF perspective, uh, we've always looked at uh, manageability as a set of, of standards and interface standards that would, uh, if, if conformed to, would allow us the greatest uh, interoperability of various platforms. And so in, in our discussions, we normally don't talk about implementations at all. Mm -hmm. um, we are, if we define the interface and define performance, then let the implementation industry implement as many different uh, 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 systems as they want in our, in our previous um, Manageable interface. We had implementations in C++ and Java, you know, every known language uh, possible, and that that allowed a lot of innovation to flourish. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, with when we did Redfish, what Redfish was trying to do was bring manageability interfaces into a much more modern uh, construct where we use RESTful uh, um, constructs and we use JSON. And so that, that was half of it, right? You, so you bring the actual interface itself into a modern world. Um, what OpenBMC is trying to do is bring the implementation side into a much more modern world because in the IPMI, in the sim world, everything was proprietary as, as I discovered when you start looking out. So, so with uh, Redfish, which is a modern interface, and with OpenBMC, which is kind of a, is an open sourced implementation, uh, you can bring this entire construct into a much more vulnerable. I think that's the intent. So um, with the five members represented here, our five, five partners, you can tell that there's a lot of collaboration going on. There is a lot of thought from you know their independent organizations as well as collaborative thought to make this a reality, to take this concept and make it a reality. Um, how it's Getting done is still under review. Uh, there's a lot of different implementations of OpenBMC out there, and I know the team here is looking at both their customers, their suppliers, their vendors, their entire you know ecosystem of partners to see what is the best uh, implementation out there. And um, so it's work in progress, <laughs> and you'll probably hear more about it. Um, definitely through our project management group with Norman and Bernie, but you'll also probably hear a lot more about it in the industry as they start to reach out to you know, their respective vendors. So you'll be seeing a lot more coming from Chris. You'll be seeing a lot more coming from you know, Facebook as well as you know, the other partners here. I'm going to leave with one more question here to Bill. Um, so my question to Bill is really on the OCP community. So you're providing this, you know, you've heard the industry leaders out here talking about OpenBMC and what it means to them and their organizations. In your perspective, what does OpenBMC mean to the OCP community? Yeah, thanks, Archna. Um, a couple of things. Um, so we're an open source hardware community and um, Along with the hardware platform, there's a lot of programmable devices, uh, project or uh, programmable logic devices, some, uh, embedded microcontrollers, and, and obviously the BIOS and firmware. And so, to truly open source a hardware platform, we need a path to open source those programmable devices. Um, in some cases, uh, an embedded microcontroller, the source code may be owned by the contributor, and, and they're actually able to open source that and share that with the community and promote innovation and, and uh, reuse. In the case of firmware, we actually had not had a path. And so OpenBMC provides that path to allow hardware platforms to be completely open sourced. Um, so besides the benefit in working together in collaboration in addressing uh, you know, the, the, the security threats that exist uh, and, and enhancing features uh, and just being more efficient with our precious engineering resources, um, that's very beneficial to to the community and and specifically to our hardware community. So we're excited that we you know that this is going on. We're excited that we have so many people that are you know willing to to have these open conversations 
um, that we just haven't seen in the past. So that's that's very exciting. Um, but as Rick mentioned earlier, um, when you uh, you know for an IT customer who has a heterogeneous environment, in other words, their IT devices come from many different suppliers, uh, whether it's servers, network equipment, or storage devices. Um, they are challenged to uh, turn those machines on, uh, connect them up, turn them on, uh, discover the machine on their network, and deploy uh, software and deploy applications on it. Um, and uh, in a heterogeneous environment, they have to use a lot of different uh, tools. Some of those may be open sourced and some of those may be proprietary tools or utilities. Um, Having a common API or common northbound interface on all these IT devices allow us to get to the point where we manage all those devices with a similar set of tools. Um, the devices respond in a similar fashion and, um, and they carry a similar set of features that, uh, that, that really the open source community can count on. So if you look at, at OpenStack and all the components of OpenStack, we will eventually get to the point where our hardware platforms will have a common set of features and that software community, I'm using OpenStack as just as one example, will know and, and be able to, to fully realize that we have our kind of lowest common denominator is this profile of properties and profile of features that exist on, um, on a heterogeneous set of hardware. So we think over time that we're going to have enable the uh, uh, hardware platforms are going to be, you know, really well managed. We're going to be able to raise the bar in terms of the features and ultimately drive efficiency um, into cloud operations. Whether that cloud is a private cloud operated by an enterprise uh, class customer or you know public cloud operated by um, a hyperscale provider. Okay. Um. I wanted to reach out to our remote audience. Were there any questions that came in? No questions. Okay. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions? Okay. Go ahead. Um, maybe for you, Chris or Sally, you already developed this. So there's, you know, obviously a huge explosion of, of added cards or, or accessories to the system from networking to storage to FPGA or whatever. Uh, and a lot of those are starting to have their own management firmware in them. What are you guys doing on the BMC side to make it easier for them to add their own modules? Just to manage that. Because you guys are all looking at kind of more of a platform level, I suspect. You know, they're not going to understand what a BMC really everything it does and want to understand everything it does, but they are going to want their device to be managed by that BMC. Uh, have you looked at that, either of you, as far as how Intel could provide a NVMe management module for the OPMC or a networking card to be added? Yeah, sure. Here's I. So that uh, question applies for our platforms. One of the cards that we use extensively is the NIC MES card. So the, there is a session going on in the next place. Actually, they're defining next generation NIC card. So the idea is the in interfaces, they have to be common, the physical interfaces. Like in this case, like NCSI and then the SM bus they are defined as part of the spec itself. Now the software piece on top of it is like the BMC, the interactions. They are modeled using the DMTF has a profile uh, PLDM protocol actually, so which is standardized in the DMTF. So we plan to use that to kind of manage any NIC mess card because we have a couple of vendors, so they provide the NIC mess card so we can manage seamlessly because the protocol is pretty much abstracted. So that's what way we see for NIC. So storage, I'm not, I cannot comment on that as I didn't work on it. In general, I mean, uh, if, if, assuming that they don't follow a standard protocol, mm -hmm. uh, that maybe the BMP is compliant or whatever, right. are you doing anything in the architecture to just make it really easy for them to just write a module, snap it in, uh, and, and let, they have to write it themselves, granted, because it, it doesn't need to make a standard interface, but allow them to snap something in so that suddenly you get a sensor or whatever. Uh, typically what we see is the other way, like we try to kind of make sure that component is following some standard which is well established before and BMC follows that uh, same spec. So we can influence the spec but not like we cannot add a card into the other side. That's what is my thinking. 
It, um, the way we've architected it is so that we try to use uh, Linux standard uh, things because when we do work in this environment, that seems to be the going uh, creation, how people write device drivers and stuff, right? So we try to make sure that um, we have the ability uh, to, to get all this stuff to work, and if it doesn't work just by traditional Linux devices or HWMON for sensors and stuff, that there is a facility that you guys can, if you have extra pieces or you know, work, you can go ahead and plug that in. Um, that's through the use of the Yocto build environment, right? It's uh, that kind of thing. <laughs> Dbus and systemd do a lot of the under in the infrastructure for people to put their own applications on top. So as I mentioned, uh, the DMTF has a, as many standards. Uh, so I mentioned Redfish as the northbound standard off platform. Um, they also have a group which does uh, on-platform standards, and uh, that's composed of a, a routing protocol to route across multiple buses. Um, so you can get from one end of the platform to another end of the platform, and on top of that is a is a data model called PLDM. Um, so that exists today, um, and it's bit-based. Uh, what we're in the process of looking at is, is there a uh, data model which is more efficient with using with Redfish so that um, when you get a Redfish request coming into BMC, you, you go to a minimum transformation before you have to go put it on on the uh, onboard bus in order to get it onto, onto a device and get that information. So we're still moving in that direction of, of finishing that. One thing uh, I want to add here is because uh, at a server level, based on the Intel architecture, we have lots of active component. Um, I think you made a very good point that if uh, we have multiple protocols, how to tie to those active components that's part of the x86 architecture, and if Intel can uh, contribute that part and provide its drivers or part of the stack that allows that OpenBMC talk to those devices, that would, would be a great improvement to what we have right now. At Microsoft, we have already proven that OpenBMC is extensible enough, uh, and we added uh, the, the driver and support to some satellite controller. It is not uh, specifically from Intel, but some other vendors. Uh, I think that proves that it's the, the framework uh, provided support. But when, when it comes to the Intel, that's a big effort, right? We have lots of active component manageability in engine, we have lots of other component that or new storage technology that Intel is introducing. I think uh, our expectation is that Intel can contribute that part. You've raised a, a question that's been on my mind for quite a while. Um, and I, I think the experience that we've had at Google is every time you get a new add-in card, you end up making a choice of do I have to go back and, and add something to either the system software or the firmware or somewhere to support this card in some way? Standards go a long way toward reducing that overhead. right? If you look at option ROMs, they solved a specific problem in the PCI space that made this possible. We're at a point where how do you do that for manageability? And if I look at the current system architecture of most servers, uh, the ability to query the storage controller about the health of a storage device from the BMC, there simply isn't the data path there. Um, and as John alluded to, there, there are standards out there, but they've not been implemented, certainly not in the open source space. And the familiarity with those standards and the implementations is not widely available. Um, as I heard recently in feedback, I, I walked into a session and it turned out most of the people in the session uh, had never heard of MCTP, but they all knew that their BMCs they wanted to be able to patch. Right? That's the sort of familiarity we have with this. Um, I really want to get to a point where we have the infrastructure in OpenBMC to support any vendor, anybody providing additional tooling and having that in a build system. But if I go and buy a new commodity component, I don't want to have to rebuild my BMC firmware to support that new device. Nor do I want to have to have a BMC firmware that supports all devices out of the box with special tools. 
I really do want to figure out how we go from the world of the first time we do manageability of, say, an NVMe device and build out what we think the standard should be to having that be a standard and having all the tooling in place so I can support any NVMe device. I don't see quite how we're getting there right now, and I think it's going to take a lot of development and experimentation. And so I'm hoping that through OpenBMC, we actually have a lot of these companies working together to explore that space from the different experience of both the device manufacturer, the system architects, the firmware development, and the actual usage in a data center environment, and try to understand what the needs are and how we can meet them. So I think we have one more question, or one question. Oh, so did you want, did you want to? Oh, okay, perfect. No, Thank you. Oh, I didn't know if you had a question, so. <laughs> I have a two-part question, but they're related. I'm kind of interested in the development status examples of platform management tools that leverage OpenBMC, if, if there's examples of that, and standardization efforts to help enable more of those things. And to give a personal example, um, I developed the uh, Facebook Acton Wedge OpenBMC power driver in Canonical Ubuntu's Metal as a Service. It's a bare metal deployment tool. But I'm confident, haven't tested it, but I'm confident it wouldn't work on the IBM version of OpenBMC. And, you know, myself and other projects, you know, I want to take it to the next level and, and get information about, for example, optics and port information on switches. Um, you know, but, you know, even as it is, I know it's not going to work on, you know, IBM's version. So w what are kind of the thoughts around standardization efforts, you know, um, to enable third-party tooling like the things that, that, that I wrote? Okay. Don't respond yet. <laughs> All right. Who wants to take the question? All right, Sai. Um, that's the reason we are here, actually, today. <laughs> Uh, the reason, as I mentioned, like first use, is, use case is you, like user who are developing software that talks to OpenBMC. That's what we want to standardize first. So that's not done today, as you, as you pointed out. I think we have a REST API, a different REST API. We have SSH utilities that are different on Facebook OpenBMC versus the DBus uh, stuff on the IBM. So totally different. So got point. So this is the reason we are going to sit and see like how we can get there. Actually, I have a question for you. So in, in, in developing your code, um, of course, there is the boot portion of the code and then application part of the code. Do you have confidence that the boot portion of the code can work in multiple systems? So uh, in, in my particular development, which is not actually on the BMC itself, it's just using the BMC, yeah, we, we leverage just XC for right? So we're Experimental metal provisioning system, so that's no issue at all. Um, and then we are leveraging uh, the BMC right now just for turning the machine on. So we'll do the network boot and turn the machine off or restart the machine, so we'll re network boot to get a different operating system, might be Ubuntu, it might be CentOS, it might be Windows. So would there be an advantage in having at least the boot portion of the code be standardized? And then later we work together to make the application part of it standardized. Right. <laughs> so, so if so, right now OpenBNC supports uh, IPMI, and I believe the target is for to uh, support Redfish. So the the vision of Redfish is actually to uh, provide a a RESTful interface for managing um, compute storage platforms and network platforms. So uh, everything from getting your port numbers to uh, defining what your network storage should be all be able to be done through a single Redfish interface. Um, so we can have a side discussion about what type of information you want, but that is the overall goal is to be able to, to manage this. Uh, within uh, OpenStack, they, uh, someone I, I, has released a Sushi driver, another Fish name, uh, which actually connects uh, OpenStack uh, to, to Redfish implementations. And so you can now connect it up to Ironic if, if necessary to get that data. So, John, your, or I'm sorry, um, David, your question described uh, an opportunity that we have. Um, 
you know, you're you're trying to you'd like to manage a platform, um, and uh, and then that interface is is not there that you, or at least the interface you can count on is not there. And I think the Open Compute Project has the opportunity to define that profile that allows you to do extra things on that on that platform. In your case, you wanted to look at optics and look at you know thermal characteristics and power characteristics of those optics. Um, through defining a profile, and John mentioned a Redfish profile, certainly uh, a profile would include uh, properties, uh, Redfish properties, it could also include IPMI properties, um, but it may include uh, properties that are used by utilities. And I think this is an example where um, we would want to look for uh, utilities that, that are, you know, that we could call standardized utilities that allow us to do and interact um, and, and gather information off of the platform that, again, adds extra value, adds extra uh, features, drives efficiency, allows us to manage that platform better. And through an open community like this, we, all of us, get to define what those features are, implement those across many different platforms, and you know, deliver features that are robust um, you know, to the to the industry and to the world. So I know we're reaching our time here, and I wanted to make sure that each one of these partners that we have up here gets their 20 minutes to present their unique perspective, and I know you want to hear it. So with that, I just want to give a round of applause to the panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to Norm here. I think Chris has it. And I think Chris and Norm, yeah. By the way, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Archna Haylock. <laughs> I work for OCP. I'm the community director. So if you have any questions, come reach out to me. Thank you. All right. I think about 20, 25 minutes, something like that. 20 minutes? Okay, cool. Yeah, leave some time for questions. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Chris Austin, as you all know. Work for IBM. All right. Up, oh, down. Okay. Galapagos Islands. Everybody in closed source worlds work in their own island, right? And what does their own islands do? They create different things, similar but different. I bet you we all have different implementations of IPMI in our own stacks. I bet you, uh, given give it a couple more years, then we have our own versions of Redfish, right? And how it does, right? So some people will have uh, blue birds with blue, <laughs> birds with blue feet, iguanas that can swim, all these cool features, right? Uh, but does it really solve what the iguana is supposed to do in life? I, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create a uh, something that works works well for others. Got to learn the down button. All right, so the OpenBMC project they call it the Intel or sorry <laughs> they call it the IBM project. Uh, the IBM BMC I don't I, I think it's great it's an honor but I really want it to be the uh, the OpenBMC project. Period. Right. It has the ability for other people to contribute to it. And don't feel like, oh, if I'm not from IBM, I can't contribute to it. Because you can, right? Everybody is. is. And what it's all about, right? It's, it's a Linux operating system. It's a Linux distribution. But it's tailored towards the embedded environment, OK? And now that's from a developer's perspective. And from a management's perspective, a project management's perspective, a business line's perspective, right? we're really trying to reduce the cost of development, right? Because everybody does their own thing. If we all get together then we will not take as long. It will not take, we will find bugs faster. We will think about things that we didn't have to think about for another year from now. We'll think about them now, and we'll actually get a better 
uh, product out to get the door. All right, so these are some of the ideas I consider personally to be views of success if we do this thing right. All right? Um, basically, we just, well, first of all, there's a, a group of code that we're all going to be able to use, a core set of code that we could all use, and that will be um, enabling. It's not to prescriptive that says this company must do this, right? It's a set of tools, it's a set of kernel, drivers, stack, thought process that allows companies to put on your own business uh, flavor, right? Your own ability to make money the way that you guys make money, right? It's a, uh, um, we get features faster, uh, it'd be great once manufacturers, people that actually create uh, you know, devices, that they also think about how that's going to work in the open BMC environment, right? I don't think there's a device out there yet or today that will just have a particular company's device driver, right? It's pretty, pretty much now you're going you're gonna to need to have a Linux device driver in order for you to uh, make, get some sales going, right? If not, all you're doing is asking the companies that are going to use it for Linux to do the development themselves. Like, well, maybe I'll use something else. All right, so if we can get the, the vendors or sorry, the creators of the hardware to actually think about how this is going to work on an open BMC environment, that's a win. Uh, system software stacks that actually support open BMC. So... Getting to, a, getting to a point where you can actually have like a Redfish implementation, then you don't even have to go into the guts of the BMC to actually start to use other, other companies can apply uh, management interactions with the open BMC. That would be a good thing. <clears throat> right, and then uh, we said it on the board here, when, when you're dealing with this homogeneous and, or sorry, heterogeneous environment, right, you, you, uh, you want things to work the same. We went and interviewed a whole bunch of different people that actually deal, interact with BMCs on a daily basis. Not create them, but use them, right? And it's like, oh, this, this company here, I have to do this. Another company is BMC, they have to do that. Um, getting to the point where that, those differences are less is better. Okay, so let's talk about the community a little bit. Um, so right now, code contributions to the github.com slash openbmc, openbmc repository, IBM, Google, Rackspace, Yadro, Invitec, Melnox, and a whole bunch more. Right? These are all people that are putting code back into the community. Um, inside our mailing list, this has grown now, so now it's 145 email addresses and 50, 51 different domains, right? That is different people from around the world all getting together, talking about it. IRC, a free node, go to OpenBMC. There are 65 users on average in the IRC chat on a daily basis, right? And this is a um, it's constant chatter going on. Uh, we went to the industry and we found eight different sponsor users for our UI or a web interface. We started talking about what do you think? What do you need? What do you go to a BMC for? From a developer's perspective, why do you go to a BMC is different from a, you know, an admin's perspective. And it was good to get that perspective, uh, right? And then we, and then the hardware uh, builds are done, code reviews are done. These are all things that are uh, donated to the project from different companies, which I really appreciate. Thank you very much. Um, active code base. So this is when we first started. We we're putting commits per day, and you can see it's just constantly growing, right? Uh, this this code base is active. People are using it. Um, Contributions from from around the world, right? I like to put this picture in because it's this nice long line of all throughout the day and night. There's always somebody on IRC. There's always development of Open BMC project going on. And so we have some new companies that have actually put I'll put their name up. Shoutouts to Yadro, uh, Nuvatan, and uh, Infotech. So what do people do? Well, why, like if you're looking at the contributions. I think this is kind of where it starts, right? You, the machine configurations, uh, then business, and then core. So from a machine contrib con contribution, it's just basically somebody trying to get involved in the project and where to start. Well, why do you start? Well, because my company says I need to do this. My boss says I need to do this. Why? Because you're enabling hardware, right? So most of the, most of the uh, initial stuff is about how I can get my own systems to work with OpenBMC. Then it was, 
yeah, but you guys do it this way, and I need to do it that way. And like, that's fine. Like, how you run your business is your own prerogative. Uh, so adjusting business logic seems to be the next step of contribution. And then finally core, you know, it's, it's like everything. Like the, the, in order to make a code accessible to everyone takes just a little bit extra effort. Instead of focusing in on your one item and how to solve your one problem, you have to start thinking about how it's going to solve for a lot of different people around the whole wide world, right? Uh, and it's not your computer, but somebody else's computer, how that works. So uh, that's my, that's my crawl, run, and walk and run. Never got that right. Okay, um, contributions. So we use the U-boot and we use the kernel. Everything that we try to do, you have to first think, does this exist in the, kernel, in the communities, open source communities already, right? Before writing it yourself. Is there something that's already there? And if there is, great, let's start thinking about how we can use that. Uh, we, will, we will put code into an upstream community um, uh, before writing it ourselves. And if there's a feature that needs to be added, we can do it and then push it up. That's a big thing because you, it's the whole thing. We're trying to get it to the point where, we're, where it's constant open source. Everything's open source. Right? We have here uh, two different types of BMCs. A speed has a 2400 and 2500, so we support both of those chips. And Nuviton is actually putting in themselves, they're putting in, uh, with the help of others, uh, their Poleg uh, BMC chip. So that's great. That's gonna, be a, that's gonna be cool because right now we only support AST, and so we have a mindset of all we have to do is 24, 2500. Now that Nuviton is actually doing development on it, now we get to think about how does the kernel modules, how does, um, how do we do Yocto layering properly so that we can support different people? Because right after this guy, there's going to be another group that's going to want to come in and have their own stuff. We're staying up to date. Uh, for the Linux kernel, we very started off at 4.4, went to 4.7. We're at 4.10 now. Uh, Linus put out 4.13, and there's starting to be a discussion about what do we do need to do in order for us to get our kernel pointing to the 4.13 tree. Uh, Yocto, same thing. The building, I remember we're at 7, 1.8, and now we're at 2.1. Right, so this is a constantly being updated project. Um, I think when it comes to how does that affect my business, right, there'll be a point in time uh, where your project manager will say, no more changes from the OpenBMC main repo. Let's start putting in the bug fixes, right, and getting them upstream and, and not join the 4.13 stream until the next server, product, whatever it is, refresh, whatever you want. But this project is, the goal is just keep moving forward and companies can then take a snapshot and then do their work on top of that. All right, so there's been some chatter on the mailing list about the tags, right? So there is a tag 2.0, it's almost here. In the tag 2.0, the slash org is gonna get removed. Uh, we've got pretty much everything moved over to the slash XYZ. This is a requirement that needs to be done because we didn't actually own the OpenBMC org, or OpenBMC.org, uh, and DBus requires uh, that level of knowledge to be done. So OpenBMC project.xyz we do own, and so therefore that's what's been going on there. Um, once the 2.0 tag hits, this org will be gone. We didn't even announce that a lot, but I just gotta keep telling people, okay, just in case you didn't hear it. Um, there's a web preview coming online. Uh, We've been the code update support. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, some, some, some security things that we've done. We've been able, able to change the, the password via REST in a nice protected way. Um, and then we've also have created the ability to stop the BIOS code from actually doing direct writes to the, uh, to the ASP chip. That's a pretty big hole where you can actually have BIOS code and actually go update a BMC. BMCs are typically what, we, what I believe is that we typically do not have them on the same network as, as the users of it, and therefore that's not a good thing to be able to go write and change the BMC code. Okay, uh, for air logs, uh, actually one of the things that the, our IBM design team went out and interviewed lots of people, they've really wanted to make something called a resolve. So we have a whole bunch of air logs uh, for a system, and you can go in and actually you should mark them as resolved. So there's a new property within Dbus that allows you to then say, this is, yes, it's an error, but I'm done with it. I don't care about this one anymore. You can delete it, but you can also mark it as resolved. 
So it stays in the log, but it says that's not a problem anymore. Association says the ability for you to uh, map in an error log to the uh, inventory item that actually is at fail, right? So if there's a log that has a dim fail in it, then you'll actually get a link to the inventory of the dim, and then that also can complain and say it's, it's broken. Uh, that's, that's good. VLAN we've added, uh, and also the ability from an IPMI to push the, uh, the network IP address changes, subnet, mask, and all that stuff. Um, and also on the boot side, we had it only being able to change the boot, and then you had to go manually change it again via REST, so we added a one-time boot support. Those are some of the features that are coming in at 2.0. Some of them are there already, but you know it, it'll get tagged all together as 2.0, and that this stuff, along with other things, are there. All right, let's take a walk. I have a question about, yep. um, I think it's great that you can change the, the password to be via the RESTful API. On a standard IPMI implementation, is that something that you can No, not yet. I'm not sure we're going to. I don't have an answer for that, but I know it's not through IPMI. It's through the REST interface. You have to authenticate first over the REST interface, and then with those REST credentials, then you can pass it a, a password change. Yeah, but nothing through the IPMI stack yet. So here's the uh, here's what it might look like. Um, this is like you going to an IP address of the BMC, right? You should be able to see some items uh, before even having to authenticate. Uh, the nice thing about this, oh yeah, it's on the next page. All right, we'll go on this one. So first of all, it's client rendered. It's not running the processing power of the AST chip or the Nubaton chip. Um, it'll be your system. So if you're on a laptop, it'll be running the your, uh, your laptop CPU to do all the rendering, HTML5, and there's been a lot of security conversations about Java, and so there has no Java. Um, everything is done via REST, so all the JavaScript and HTML uh, index file is all pushed to the client, your browser will load it up, and then it will make REST calls back to the BMC uh, via the same REST calls that we use today uh, to get all this information out. So, you know, it's simple. this is like an overview page, you can tell you if the power is on or off, and these are the things that uh, admins from the, the sponsor user study was done and said, this is the stuff, when I go to a BMC, this is what I want to see. Okay, so we put it all on one page. You can actually turn the LED on and off. You should be able to launch a serial over LAN session, a console session uh, uh, from there, and, and lots of different things, health and server control and users, and, and this, is, this is a tag here, it's called ad servers. All servers, we'd like to get to that. We'd like to be able to say that once you see one BMC, you see them all within a subnet, right? Uh, that would be great because when you're trying to load in 10 of them, right, just log into one, now you can see the rest of them, and then if you want, if, um, and we've got to figure this part out, but the goal would be to be able to do multi-section or multi-system work, like power them all on, off, code updates, discover the, uh, the state of their event logs, that kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. Hey Chris, yep. do you guys support um, C serial over land or do you support KVM or virtual media in this? No, I'd love to. It's totally something that we want, yep. And open source, man, is a to-do. Let's work together on it because I, I've seen it in the past. I've loved it. You know, you'd be able to boot off of your laptop's hard drive in order for you to give yourself an image from a developer. That's awesome. I don't have to go into the lab, right? It's not a feature that we have support for right now, but I would love to be able to get there. Yep. To the side platform? I know. <laughs> <laughs> when you do it, do it in HTML5 as well. But almost every KVM virtual media solution out there is Java, and our customers take that. Yep. Yeah, actually, for the serial over land, that, that's a good point. Uh, that there are solutions out there already in Java, but there was a there was something that was done in a different technique that is not security problem. So, 
we did it that way. Okay, the other feature that I wanted to talk about, 20, oh shoot, well I didn't get very close to being done. So the other features I want to talk about was the new flash architecture. Uh, there are two different ways. So one is the flash file system, FFS, that's what you have. It's the default that it is. There's been an introduction of a new style, uh, UBI FS, uh, and that should give you some uh, additional brick, brick protection. Uh, you should be able to flash your systems a lot faster, uh, and that you should be able to uh, get wear leveling if you choose a NAND part instead of a NOR part. You also should be able um, to put multiple BMC images, and then we can easily point which one you want to boot from. So right now, if the flash file system right now, you, you just have one boot image, and in theory, if you have the space, why not support as many boot images as you, as your business wants you to support, right? Okay, you want to try this code base out, you don't even have to have hardware or even a mainframe. Uh, you can run QEMU, which we have support for. We've always had support for the 2400, but we've added a contribution was added to do it for the 2500 as well. And um, it supports reboot now, which is nice because it did in the past. What's, what's that do? It helps you out when it comes to automated testing. Okay? Uh, the automated build environment, uh, if you go to openpower.xyz, you can go to the OpenC, OpenBMC build. You can actually see every single commit uh, gets built, compiled against all those different systems right now. And I think with the, I'd like to have the ability to do this for more systems. And then, of course, there'll be a problem with that. And how on earth do you do all that compute power in order to get that done? That's a, that's a problem that I'd love to, I'd love to have that problem. Yeah, all right, code reviews. Some people didn't know about this. So over here at garrett.openbmcproject.xyz, you can actually uh, see all the code that's being contributed. I sometimes use some company names just uh, in our conversations. The reason why is because they, they contributed to an open project, right? So you'll actually see that and I'll say, that's why I can, hey, Google's doing this work, right on. Thank you, I appreciate that work. There's the code contribution. Um, Oh yeah, so really fundamentally here, um, this is what the, the core infrastructure really is all about when it comes to OpenBMC, right? System D is how you actually manage your processes. That's a common thing within the Linux industry. Uh, in order for us to communicate via different companies, instead of you being on the phone call and finding out what interface you have, let's just standardize it. And there's a DBus interface. It tells you exactly what things it can produce and the type, you know, int, Boolean, whatever it is, that'll that comes from that. Uh, right now it's a REST, and yeah, we did put the support for IPMI in there. All right, I'm going to skip a few because because we're wrapping it up, right? So the idea here is that you know there'll be a piece, uh, there'll be hardware technology there, though this Dbus core interface, and it doing is broadcasting stuff from it, right? Maybe it's broadcasting at the RPM just changed in this fan, and then any company can put on their own. Uh, company logic that says this is what I do when I find out the RPMs are, are, are changing, right? I, from one single company, from, in, uh, from IBM, cannot tell you how to run your systems. I'm not even going to try, right? I just want to be able to provide you the information so that you can make decisions any way you want, all right? So, any questions? No? All right, thanks. Yeah. So the Microsoft guys are next on the list. Are you all gonna you wanna use your laptop or okay. Yeah, they have a UDP. Uh, there was one in here.
go. Good. So, uh, about a year ago, we started to uh, work on the Open BMC and put that on a couple of products uh, that uh, we are getting ready to ship those into the data center. So, uh, we have presented those products in the last OCP summit. Uh, one of those is uh, JBOV, uh, and the other the one was uh, uh, GPGPU. So we have used uh, uh, a little bit different hardware architecture, uh, but the core fun functionality remained the same. So uh, we'll quickly review the, some of the manageability hardware architecture for JBOF, JBOF, and as I said, GPGPU and uh, some of the feature that we develop for, for these enclosures uh, based on the OpenBMC. Actually, we extended some of the functionality around the OpenBMC uh, to provide uh, uh, manageability for those enclosure. And uh, we did some per uh, performance optimization around the OpenBMC. I will share some results with you and also some security enhancement. Uh, also, uh, to make the OpenBMC qualify uh, to be shipping a product, actually we had to do lots of testing. And we invest a lot on, on the OpenBMC testing and uh, we got very good result. So, actually, uh, just a quick overview, what is the manageability at, the, at the, those enclosure? So at the core, we have the BMC chip. It can be from the AS, most of the time we use the ASP. Uh, in this specific case, that was 2520. Uh, we had dual spy flash with uh, DDR4. And uh, we have the uh, PWM tachometers for the uh, closed loop fan control. Uh, and uh, in this case also we have four IO expander uh, from Broadcom actually connected to the uh, BMC and we have the I2C and UART connection between those. So I2C was to, for the SM bus communication between BMC and expander to collect uh, some of the data, get the event log out of the expander and UART uh, for was for console redirection. And uh, in each enclosure, we have two PSU, two redundant PSU that are connected through the PM bus to the BMC. And uh, we have about uh, 200 uh, different type of sensors, including analog and discrete. So another Overview of the, the hardware, it's a single board uh, 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 solution or PCB that has a PCB with lots of connectors that connect to the, the IO expander boards and to the PSUs and uh, different components across the enclosure. So as uh, the Redfish uh, is our standard interface to allow the manageability to connect to the rest of the data center infrastructure. So we implemented the Redfish interface uh, into the OpenBMC. And uh, the other main feature uh, for us was to create a, a unified mechanism for the firmware update because uh, uh, for us, uh, BMC should be able to update the firmware, firmware for each component. So we have lots of components here. In this case, is the expander and the PSU. But the idea is that have one single mechanism to allow us to update the, uh, those, uh, those components. So we extend whatever was 
available uh, for the firmware update, but we just tweaked that a little bit. We changed the pull model to the push model, and we leveraged the secure, secure file, file transfer uh, to allow the transfer the binary file, the image for the firmware component, and then we are sending a redfish command to actually initiate the firmware update for BMC, PSU, or Expander. Also, we extended the SSH uh, console redirection because initially the OpenBMC at that time was shipped with the one single uh, instance of the SSH console redirection. So we extend that to have the uh, console redirection over SSH for including for BMC and the four IO expander. And uh, we implemented the driver and the SMBus protocol uh, between BMC and IO Expander, so now we can get the uh, information from the IO Expander. Uh, we also get some tools from the IO Expander vendors. Uh, those tools uh, was for Expander IO uh, recovery, and we integrated that into the OpenBMC framework. Uh, also, as I said, the hardware. Uh, incorporate two dual flash, so we extended the firmware update to support the dual flash. So now, uh, if something happens to the primary flash, the BMC can boot to the secondary and we can do the recovery uh, through the secondary. And uh, also we leverage these uh, to enhance the security and I will present some information on that. We added the firmware signing uh, to the open BMC stack and uh, uh, also uh, PSU firmware update, so we extend the PM bus to support the PSU firmware update, and uh, we added the NTB time synchronization also. Uh, we needed some light, very light support on the IPMI that we added those, which is the sessionless uh, IPMI over LAN. To uh, in some cases, the rest doesn't work very well or is not fast, so we need to get some information. Uh, uh, and we uh, we realize that the IPMI in this case might be a little bit faster, but it's very minimal functionality. So, as I said, we did some performance optimization. So, uh, and I'll share some results with you. But in general, we improved the. The, at first, I said we improved. The, we implemented the Redfish, and uh, later on, we had to put some effort down to improve the response time also for event log and sensor reading. And uh, we also need to uh, apply some changes to support the concurrent Redfish requests. For example, up to ten. That was our requirement. And uh, firmware update. Uh, uh, the update time was improved, and in general, uh, we were closely monitoring the CPU usage and the load, load average during the uh, uh, ideal time and during uh, the time that uh, uh, the BMC is stressed, and we, we made some improvement in those, those areas. And also, the, uh, we made some optimization around the DBoss access. Uh, we also enable the we work with the the A suite actually to get the QSY driver and we integrated that to the open BMC. ASP2400 has a QSY support and so we got that driver we integrated. We did a bunch of tests to make sure it's it's, it's reliable and robust enough uh, to help us with the boot time actually and the decompression. And uh, an original open BMC stack that we use on 2500, we enable the uh, dual IO mode uh, driver in U-boot and in the kernel also. Some of the uh, optimization effort we put down, uh, one of the things that we realized that uh, DBus is a great idea. DBus actually allows you to create a the architecture, firmware architecture is loosely coupled, it's isolated, and at the same time it can be extended. Uh, but the challenge is the way that DBus is being used, uh, the, 
we have to be aware of that there's some performance impact. If the DBUS is used in the, 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 the right uh, method, uh, probably will have the best performance out of that. So one of the things we did actually is enough to get the, the, some of the sensor individually over the bus, we did the aggregation. For example, for the fan control, we have uh, 12 sensors. And instead of uh, reading each sensor individually, we did aggregation and we noticed that there is improvement. So we, we leverage the aggregation. And we reduce the number of the DBUS interaction for sensor uh, retrieval over at fish. And also we did the same for the event log. Uh, one of the things that we noticed, we don't need to go through the DBUS for, to access the data for everything. So we created a short path, for example, for event log. Uh, we created another pass from the Redfish to the, to the event logging system to get the, the event log faster. Uh, also, uh, our uh, study showed that if we can use the, generate the JSON without using the, the Python template, probably it creates a better response time. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the requirements for us was to have the concurrent Redfish request comes onto the BMC and to be responded. So we changed the, the original web server with the USWGI and Cherry Pi. Why we picked two actually web server? Because first we just picked the Cherry Pi and uh, on two platform using 2520 and 2400. The, the performance on 2520 was, was good, so we keep it there, but on 2400 we had some challenges, so we started looking at a, a, a lighter version of the web server that was more suitable for 2400, because 2400 is just running at the 400 megahertz versus 2520, which is, can be up, run up to uh, 8 me 800 megahertz. So in this case, we had to leverage two uh, different uh, web server. And uh, the other thing, uh, the methods to get the, the DBoss attributes, uh, so we apply some changes and APIs and we improve the, some uh, improvement in that area. The other thing was uh, the sensor monitoring actually, uh, for us the requirement was to collect the sensor the data every second, but uh, we noticed that the, the sensor monitoring task is actually wake up every millisecond, and uh, again, it creates some impact. And that's the CPU usage that actually impact the other services that we have. So we made some updates uh, uh, on those area, and uh, some of the unused recipe also, we did some cleanup on those. And uh, one of the other uh, interesting experience we had uh, was initially, the, for example, the, some of the CLI that we added or PSU firmware update was all written in the Python. And uh, the, for that PSU firmware update, uh, the, the result was not acceptable. So we changed those tools from Python and C and we noticed lots of improvement. Uh, it gave, gave us some guidance, maybe we should be aware of that. Uh, Python is great, uh, programming tools, but uh, we know that that's, there is some uh, cost involved with that. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we changed some of the uh, coding from the Python to the C. Some of the optimization result. Uh, so boot time to the Redfish is uh, uh, CTQs, that is the critical quality for us that uh, uh, we put some effort in that, and on 2400 we got very good result. So we bring down the uh, the boot onto the redfish from 242 second down to 84 second, and 2500 we already apply some optimization. Now we are around 105 second, and still we are putting some effort into that to make it faster. 
Reading all sensor on two different platforms. In one platform, we have 172 seconds. So the total, uh, the original value was 85 seconds to get those uh, 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 all sensor uh, through the redfish. And after some optimization, we bring it down to 12 seconds. And we had the same improvement uh, on the 2400 platform as well. Uh, one of the modifications we did, we noticed that if we want to get the uh, events log, all the logs uh, through the Redfish, usually Redfish, no matter what is the implementation, is not, is not fast. You know that, right? There is some latency involved that. And uh, one of the requirement uh, uh, for our data center operation is to create a snapshot of the event log and uh, uh, pump it this to the next level in the telemetry system as soon as possible. So our requirement was, uh, so we have the event log of maximum length of 4,000 entry. So the way that actually we did is not to get, I, the, our Redfish support that, you can get all the event logs for the red, Redfish, but to make it faster, we. Uh, created a different method. In that case, actually, we created a snapshot. We send a redfish command, it creates a snapshot, it zip it up, and then we get it uh, uh, through the SFTP. And we realized that that that's can be much faster. So we can see uh, for 4,000 entry, we can do it in 12 seconds, in 2,500. But also we made some improvement on the, if we want to get the uh, logs over the redfish now, we are around 41 seconds to get 4,000 entries. And we made some improvement on the BMC firmware update uh, and PSU firmware update, and we bring those uh, number down. Uh, also the CPU utilization that uh, after some of the modification we did, so now with 2,500, we at idle cycle, at the idle state, we are at around 20, 30%. 2,400 is a little bit challenging, whatever effort we put in there, uh, because the, the, the CPU is not, is not fast enough. Uh, but 2,500, I think, can be a, a better reference for us, and uh, we were able to bring the load average from 1.8 to 0.6. But if you com compare the 2400 and 2500, we can see that based on the clock frequency, the load average between 2500 and 2400 is, is uh, comparable. Some of the security enhancement that we did, uh, so we have a dedicated security team. They did uh, uh, some of the security review, they identified some of the security gaps that uh, we had. Uh, one of the improvements, we added the firmware signing. So now OpenBMC can do the, when we want to the update the signing, uh, uh, we can pass the signature with the uh, original image and the firmware verify the signature based on the public key which is stored in the file system. And uh, we created a version of the secure boot. It is not a full-fledged type of secure boot, but as we have dual flash, so we made uh, the primary flash read-only, and uh, we stored the key in the primary flash. And when the BMC boots, the U-boot in the primary flash, it validates the uh, images, uh, the, the U-boot kernel on RFS in the secondary flash. And, uh, if the, the, the signature of those partition are okay, then it allows the BMC to continue to the secondary. That actually was one of the improvements that we introduced. As I said, we extensively tested the open BMC. Uh, we have created open source tools, not dedicatedly for uh, open BMC. We have leveraged this tool to, to test the BMC uh, uh, that use the IPMI, uh, but uh, our idea was to create a test tool that can be leveraged across the platform, no matter what is underlying. BMC, uh, we can use the, the same, same tools. So we created these tools that have been adopted by the Microsoft partner and some of the ODMs. They are contributing, they're working on that. And by this tool, it's created a test framework. It's extendable through the Python or XML. You can define the test scenario. 
And uh, we created lots of stress actually on the open BMC. And one of the good things I found that actually the, the original BSP that shared with the open BMC, that's really stable. So we put lots of stress on the network, for example, we created a, uh, uh, lots of traffic for a long period of time. And uh, uh, we noticed that we have a robust and reliable solution. So open, uh, this uh, PyTest util actually, it, it create a hierarchical login, it create a verbose log uh, for the redfish, or it can just create a summary of the, all the uh, tests it, it has done, which is a hierarchical view. And uh, still we are, we are doing some more work around that uh, to actually allows us to create, and PyTest UTR our plan is to add the REST API so we can uh, pump up all the uh, test result back to the, to the web server. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, as we have discussed this a couple of times, uh, from Microsoft perspective, the feature set performance, availability, and security are the corner case of the, the manageability at cloud scale. And uh, uh, we need to pay attention to all those, uh, we believe that we have to pay attention to all those uh, requirements and create a good tra traceability between those requirements and the implementation. That's uh, uh, one of the key factors to make sure that the OpenBMC succeed in, in future. Also the development model, there's lots of contribution and uh, uh, it requires that we need to establish a good development model uh, to, to ensure that we get good uh, quality work at the end of the day. And uh, as we already discussed that, uh, hopefully we can apply the lesson learned and uh, the in, uh, expertise which is available across uh, many companies working on the open PMC to improve the functionalities. Okay. You said we had two platforms. This was, you were using Sun, was a JBot, I forgot. So actually, uh, the first product we are going to ship is JBot. And uh, after a short time that we ship the JBot, we have another platform is the GPGPU. GPGPU is 2400. And the third platform that we are going to ship the open beams on that is the JBuff. One more, a couple more questions over here. Yeah, the Redfish implementation of GAT is it based off of the OCP scheme that we're working on? No, uh, actually, uh, we have already implemented the Redfish on the, our Rack Manager. Actually, we just poured that implementation into the Open BMC. Yeah. So my question is that um, open source. So yeah, th that's the thing that we are working on. That uh, our focus uh, was to to ship the Open BMC in the real products. So it it has taken lots of bandwidth from us. And the next step is we want to make it open source. Yeah, that's our plan. But we have had the discussion with the, all the major contributors. Okay, how we should go through that process. One more question. Yeah, that was my question. Okay. Thank okay. You. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So next up was uh, Saeed, right? You're going to use your laptop? Okay. Cool. You need a dom. You have a dom. Okay, good. Good. Hmm. Yeah. It's not on? I think it's on. It's on? No. Oh, it's on. Okay. <laughs> cool. 
before I talk about Unified Open BMC, I would like to share some of the work that we're, we are doing at Facebook. So um, when we talk about system management uh, at scale, unlike like HPC or enterprise, we don't have too many requirements. They are pretty simplified, limited subset. So all we want to do is like look at what inventory we have, what kind of fruits, part number, serial number, asset tag, kind of information. And we would like to monitor these systems continuously for voltage, power, temperature, et cetera, and then log in case of violations. And also like uh, use the temperature to kind of drive fans. And we have a bunch of uh, firmwares uh, sitting under the, on the platform, like uh, CPLDs, BIOS, voltage regulators. We would like to get, to the, get the versions of those firmwares and update if needed. And we would like to have remote access, like remotely want to do some kind of power control, power off, power on, uh, graceful reset, uh, graceful shutdown, and also like get the access to the console in case if host doesn't boot, like to do any early level boot debug, for example, like postcode. So how these kind of features are implemented in the industry? So if you look at the compute, there is a well-established standard like system management, like using IPMI in 98, uh, that defines the BMC with the Intel HP and all they got together and then got the IPMI spec going on. So that has been a successful story for the last 20 years. If you look at the storage, the storage industry, the, uh, the system management, like these features we mentioned, were done by a proprietary, like a SAS controller or a PCIe, expansion uh, expander firmware. Like the vendor provides these kind of features for the storage. If you look at the network, so it has the control plane and data plane, and the system management like fans, controls, monitoring is done as a single process on the control processor itself. This is the uh, lay of the land uh, before OpenBMC. So how we use uh, BMC at Facebook? So, so in the first generation, we don't have any BMC at all. Uh, like in the first generation, OCP systems, if you take a look at, to like 2011 contributions, there is no BMC. Like all these systems that compute storage, there is no BMC. On the networking side, we use third-party switches. So in the next generation, we added BMC. But the software, we use third-party BMC. The ODMs uh, take the third-party BMC and then add the features that we needed. So then we started, as I explained before, like the wedge project. Uh, that's when we found like we need to add a BMC to the networking switch also, so that we can manage BMC just like a server. And once we added that, we want to find a firmware. We couldn't find it anywhere. And then we started writing our own. And then we took the same approach and then said, why can't we do the same thing for the Yosemite, which is our multi-node uh, server? It needs more complex uh, software features for that to manage a server compared to a networking switch. So we added all those uh, software uh, features, and then we released uh, OpenBMC for Yosemite. And then on the storage side, we took the same approach for when we did our JBOF, the Lightning project. So we added BMC to that, so that we, instead of using the proprietary firmware for managing, we use OpenBMC to manage the uh, storage also. So after that, all the other products that we have been doing in the last couple of years, which are all announced, uh, they, those are all like uh, OpenBMC supports all those platforms. So at this moment, like uh, these are all not deployed yet. So these are platforms, some of them are uh, announced in the OCP summit in the March. So we have about uh, half a million systems that we are managing today with OpenBMC. And we expect that number to go up pretty qu quickly as we deploy these other systems that are announced. And we have other products that are coming up in future. So when we show the OpenBMC to our users, internal users, we just show this pretty picture. We say there are uh, limited IPMI commands. You can just use IPMI tool to kind of talk to BMC, get the information. Or on the out of band, you have two interfaces, either a REST API or a SSH. You can just use, just the way they log into a host, they can log into BMC and then run some tools. Or they can use REST API. This is a pretty picture we show. But once we go into the internals, like how, the, how does it look like today? So on the bottom, we have the hardware, the A-Speed chip. I think all of our products use A-Speed, uh, 2400 or 2500 series. And then uh, we, have, we use uh, U-Boot and Linux kernel. And these are pretty much leveraged from the vendor. 
So we have not spent much of time in uh, up upstreaming uh, the changes that we did. And we took a lot of SDK code and then just fixed them only as needed. Like say, if you find a bug in I2C driver, we keep iterating and then fixing it and upstreaming it, updating our open source software, but not upstreaming into the kernel, Linux kernel. So we did a little, very little work on this layer. And then the first application that when we started uh, for the wedge, for example, all we had was a bunch of scripts that does different things that, as I mentioned before, like power on, power off. And then for all those scripts, they just assume the A speed chip. So they just use devmem to kind of talk to the hardware, just set a bunch of registers, and then get the work done. So it's uh, tightly coupled to the hardware itself. Then we like this uh, Unix uh, philosophy. So all the applications that we need are try to make it as much as possible standalone. So they doesn't need to talk to each other. So for each of these domain or feature is implemented as a separate daemons. But we found like there are some areas where we need to communicate, like say um, IPMI. So we need to, we get messages from KCS or IPMB. We need to get the IPMI stack uh, running and then get a response. So for those things, we use the Unix socket as a um, uh, mechanism and we use just a client server uh, technology. So the server, and then we have uh, Unix socket open, and this listens for the client connections, and then respond with the response. So this is our uh, structure. Um, and then in some other cases where we just need to share a little bit of information, we don't need to talk between IP, using IPC, which is a more uh, heavyweight to talk to open session and then get the um, response back. So sometimes we just need to share a configuration, like say power on policy, or it could be a, like a power state. So to those cases, we created a global KV store, key value store, one for the non-volatile, one for the volatile. And this is where the applications just look at the uh, key and then get the value. So this is one of the other place where we need to share between applications. And the user interface, uh, the SSH are the utilities, uh, and then they use these uh, services to kind of uh, respond to the user. So when I look at it, so there are a uh, lot of drawbacks actually. Even though it works like we have deployed like 500,000 servers, we see that there's things can be improved. So I identify like three different areas where we can improve. One is the hardware attachment. So most of our services, they just assume it's a speed chip. They use devmem register access, the watcher timer, exactly they know exactly what number they need to use. So we need to uh, fix that. The second thing is there is no way for me to uh, do event publishing and subscribing model. So in this case, if I want to get a service, I need to kind of uh, talk to one service and get it. And then all of the clients have to do the same thing. Instead of that, if I can, if there is a way, if I can get notified, if something happens, like say a fru is remote, a lot of demons are interested in that event. In this structure, there is no, uh, today we don't have any uh, event sub publisher subscriber model. So all we do is post an event or post an update to the status in the KV store, and all the demands will be pulling that state to get notified about this new change. So I would like to change that. And then the, since we are using a global KV store, there is a tight coupling between the demands. So anytime there's no common namespace. And we took a look at IBM's uh, repo, and then the dbus seems to be the one of the, solving one of these problems. So we like that approach. And then this has happened like not now, but nine months back. Uh, so this is all before unified BMC talks that we had recently. So bottom layer looks same, and we propose to have some kind of, it's again, uh, this is not work in progress, but it's pretty much like the thoughts uh, as of now. There is no, due to the schedule pressure, we couldn't get into the implementation phase yet. And then, uh, but idea is to have some kind of hard, hardware abstraction layer so that we can support different chips if possible in future. Like as Chris was mentioning, there is poor like BMC implementation. In those cases, we don't assume the user applications to be knowing on what platforms they are running. We would like this hardware abstraction layer to take care of that for the user applications so that the stack remains very um, static, if you will. And on the application side, so we want to convert these demons into uh, platform services. Um, being a fan of uh, SOA, like uh, the service-oriented architecture, I think we can do uh, microservices on the BMC itself and then use DBus uh, as a system bus. So uh, in this model, all the uh, services will be providing the services on the DBus, and then it provides the discoverability, like the new demons coming up, they can discover what is available, and then they can consume the services. 
And on top of it, we have multiple platforms that are uh, supported. Like it's not just one common code. So in that case, we propose to have some kind of platform services where we can isolate all the platform specific stuff, like the configuration for the uh, services. Each service configuration can be done uh, platform uh, in, the, in the platform service module, which will be plug and play. So when we take the entire stack, we just need to replace one of the service which specifies the platform specific stuff into that. And it can push all the configuration into the different daemons, and the daemons can be as much common as possible. In this model, the user interface, like the utilities and the uh, REST API, will simply plug into the DBus interface and consume those services. So this is where we were like nine months back. We thought we need to change our stack without impacting our users. So like the users, the tools that are running are the REST API that consumers, they will not see any difference. Just because we are changing only the infrastructure layer, but the user interface layer can still remain same. That is when we had a little interest on from other companies, like from the OCP Foundation and other interested parties. And we came up with the thought of you know, unified open BMC. How, what if we can all combine and then join our hands and then come with one open source uh, project that can uh, help all the companies? So I see as uh, two different aspects. One is the user and administration uh, perspective. So they look at, they want to manage systems seamlessly, like whether it is a storage, compute, network, it doesn't matter. In future, it could be power supply. So they want to see a way to configure same, similarly. I just want to configure my NTP. I, I, I would like to do it on OpenBMC. I should be able to do the same. Or the tools that they're using for updating firmware could be similar. Uh, so the other thing is like external software integration to David's point, I think he, people are developing some tools that interact with OpenBMC. People are not going to come to OpenBMC and consume these directly. They might use some tools, some software, which is need to be integrated with OpenBMC to provide these services. So that's the view from um, the advantage uh, from the user or admin. And from the developer point of view, more features. So when I uh, took a look at this uh, new stack, there are about 60 different features or 60 different bigger tasks, sub-projects that need to be done to complete that, uh, that stack. As a single company, I do not envision to be done in not even a year, actually. It will take much more than that. And some of the switches, if we classify them, like they're high priority, low priority, and mid priority. And most of the time, our, cons our time will be consumed by the high priority tasks. But what if we join hands and say some of the other company needs takes treats that low priority task as a their higher priority task. And some features like say remote KVM, which we may not never use it. So that is our low priority, but some other company might be using it uh, day in and day out. So they might be needing it earlier. So we can get to more features done pretty quickly if we join hands. The second thing is extensible design. So today when we uh, design a feature, we just get visibility from only like three or four or five or handful of people who can take a look at it and comment and then give feedback. But now with this community, I think I see an opportunity for us to uh, share the design where people can take a look at their user, their usage model, use cases, topology. They might suggest feature the changes to the design in such a way that it can benefit all of us. And then the secure code, I think so we discussed before, so as the more eyes get into the code, I think the code will become more secure because people identify the security issues quickly and then they can suggest um, other implementation immediately. So that will be more secure. I think from developer point of view, I see these advantages. What are the challenges actually? So one is documentation. So today, I think if I see my Facebook OpenBMC, we don't have any documentation. It's all code. Just go read code and then understand. Anybody new coming up, we just direct them to kind of yeah go there and then just read the code. That's it. No documentation, period. So I think, but if we want to work at this level, like a bigger forum, I think we definitely need to improve on the documentation side. And then the efficient workflow. So today, if I want to uh, change anything, it just, I can tap my coworker and then I can get diff approved within like uh, five minutes. My code can go into the online within five minutes, but it's not possible with uh, so many worker, uh, I mean, people working across uh, regions. So I think, this is going to introduce a little bit of delay, but we need to find out a uh, better workflow where we can get the code review feedback quickly so that we can get move fast. And then the reference platform. So we don't have, everybody has their own hardware. Hardware is um, very variety of hardware actually, and then OpenVMC is 
closely tied to the hardware to uh, some extent, actually, even though we try to do a lot of abstraction. So I would say if we need to kind of continue this kind of development, we should find some QMU is one way, or having a reference platform, hardware platform will be good, so that we can, any changes we are doing, we can always test it before. And the last one is like having some kind of validation test suite. So whenever we change something, some major feature, core feature, if we can have a pre-existing validation test suites that can run on this new change, and then before we get approved and then push it into the code base, that will be great. So these are all kind of challenges which I think we need to kind of work through as we move uh, towards this coming up with a unified BMC as one source repo. That's it. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up was either. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up was either you guys or Intel. I can't remember. Anybody want to volunteer to go? Intel? Y'all don't have anything? Okay. okay. Intel's next? Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, mine, mine will be pretty quick compared. I'm, I'm going to give you the status of where we're at today at Intel. Um, so we started looking into this last year. We had a couple of starts and stops that uh, impacted us, but we probably started earnestly here like in March, April this year. Um, so our plan is uh, for the OpenBMC to be our the future of our products. Um, uh, and that's about it on that. Um, and part of the uh, open source, we're, we're, my team is new to the open source community, so we're kind of learning as we're going here. But we have the advantage that we're, we have the Yocto team to kind of shepherd us through this. But we're fully committed to uh, committing to the open source principles of uh, collaborating and upstreaming and as soon as, as, soon as I get approval for that. Um, and one one of the things that we want to do with our our project too is have a Redfish inter, Red Redfish reference uh, uh, implementation too. But it's good to hear that other people are doing the same thing. Um, and one of the things that we have to do on our platforms is we some of the changes that we're working on now are um, we like data driven. We need a David data driven model where uh, the source code is common and you're configuring your devices on certain I2C buses and any of the GPIOs that it's on, and you're changing configuration tables and not code. Uh, and we take it to the next level too, where we want to have an implementation that uh, will support multiple platforms with that one binary image, so that we can have one image that will support multiple platforms. And those are some of the challenges that we have. Um, we're trying to change even some of the ways that we've done things in the past, where we want to do auto discovery for for devices that are out there, and uh, uh, starting from the our base configuration, go out there, discover that devices are there, and of course that's a challenge because um, you don't always get a presence signal for fruits and stuff. So we're working through some of those challenges, um, and big on my plate is uh, the security aspect of it, which. Um, we have our own secure boot. 
um, implementation. We have we have a constraint where we only have one flash image, and we put two images down in there, and uh, we have to boot those securely. Um, and part of part of that for us is that was one of the questions I was having for the Microsoft guy was um, key replacement. That's always a challenge for for doing the secure boot stuff. Uh, we we have a solution for that. We think it's good and robust. We'll find out when we check it in. Uh, we've, we've gone through security reviews with it, but different set of eyes will be a different scary thing to go through. Um, so, uh, and, and part of our our tasks with the OpenBMC project too is we have to follow through our security design lifecycle as well. So we're going to be going through a whole slew of analysis and code reviews and static analysis tools. Um, and that's going to be a challenging with all the open sourceness that we have. And that's going to be one of the challenges I think we're going to have with the community is enforcing some of those best practices. Um, you know, uh, unsecure APIs that you know, security people deem insecure. Uh, that's, we've run into that challenge now where we go through and we will upgrade those uh, source code files when we run into them. We're not going to go through and you know, spend you know, five years to clean up the whole Linux offering system and stuff. Hopefully we'll get there. Um, and, and we've already touched on it. It's like one of the big benefits here is getting hardware vendors to, to add their value quickly and not, not have to wait on somebody else to, to implement the manageability for their, for their devices. Um, and getting the manageability commodization, that's, it's interesting to hear that you want to take this when I hear BMC, I always think of baseboard management controller, but going into switches and storage controllers, it kind of changes the, the definition of what a BMC is. Um, so I, I'm, it's interesting to, to learn how the different usage models are that people have, um, different than, than my own world. Um, and what Sai talked on, I want to iterate too, is like having those common interfaces where I always hated, I've, I've, we've always hated having our utilities cup, tightly coupled to our implementation in the firmware. I don't like when I change the firmware, if I change a revision number, all of a sudden my, my utility has to change. That's just absurd. Uh, so uh, coming up with a common method for doing um, firmware updates and configuration where it's as simple as possible and the utilities don't have to know anything about the firmware. That's one of my personal goals. Um, simplest implementation there I can think of is be uh, SCP or TFTP and get it on there and let the firmware figure out what it needs to do with it. Um, and some of the other things that we have to do in our, our platforms are uh, doing remote management controller updates, which everybody else has already said they have to do too. Uh, I've been through several implementations of doing that and I think we can come up with some good ways to do that and it'll be interesting to to see how that flies with the review, the public review on that. Um, and that's, uh, I wish I can give you a timeline on when we're, we're doing this, but I, we're, we're still spinning wheels. Um, but the sooner we can start collaborating, it'd be interesting to, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of parallel efforts going on. It's like some of the presentations that from Microsoft uh, and I, first thing we noticed was that <laughs> There's a lot of parallel work that's being done, um, and it sounds like it's very similar in nature. So the faster we can push, the better. I think everybody will be. And if um, I'll leave it at that. Um, for me personally, this is like a a great thing to happen. So I can't. I mean, I I can't. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. I've been through several generations of firmware. BMC firmware, and uh, to me, this is like the pinnacle of of this domain. And hopefully, we'll uh, we'll make it rock. That's all I got. Go, go for it. Uh, when you mentioned the security stuff, did you, did you scan with the current code stack and discover like a bazillion things? Or? We haven't yet, but that's that's on our that's on our plate to do. Have you done it? You have you? Done clockwork. <laughs> okay, so, and that'll be part of our continuous integration is doing the clockwork scans. That's. Okay, 
We're doing this on a uh, Skylake platform, uh, one that we're shipping currently. So. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thanks. I detected a little fear in in uh, dealing with the upstream community. Maybe uh, so I would. No, I know it's a little daunting, and especially some of the kernel developers, they can be a little uh, interesting to work with. Yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah. It's going to be fun. Yep. Oh, good. Don't worry, it builds character, I promise you. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Rick Alther, uh, and talk a little bit about how we've used OpenBMC in Google. Um, so a little, a little context, uh, Google has designed machines for a very long time. Uh, and traditionally, in the, in the very early days, we had no management controller at all. Uh, everything was done purely through the host processor, pulling the sensors directly, doing all the fan control and everything as daemons in user space. Um, over time, this got to be problematic, and we started moving things into a bare metal microcontroller for, to keep the real-time requirements. And we've been using that solution up until this year. So it's still actually deployed in production. Uh, what we found through this is that it requires a lot of effort to maintain. We have our own bare metal implementation. We have to modify it for every single platform we deploy. Sometimes we've developed like a chassis that has multiple cards that go into it, and we have to tune it for each one of those. Um, this is just, it's become burdensome, and we also have some difficulties in terms of staffing, of being able to find people that do bare metal uh, microcontroller work that also understand sort of how it fits into the overall infrastructure. So why did we go to OpenBMC? Well, uh, the, the, the short version of this answer is we did Zaius as an open compute project, and we realized that if we... Uh, put a microcontroller down as a management solution, nobody would use the design. So we looked at what other people were doing and, and said, let's do a BMC. And that raised a lot of questions about what firmware stack do we actually want to put on. We decided to go with a, the OpenBMC stack primarily because with a Linux-based solution, we knew it was going to be easier to customize. We knew it would be much easier to find people who understood a Linux environment. We could go get kernel developers, we could get user space folks, we could pull together pe people from different specialties to make that work out of our more general population of software engineers. Um, and we could leverage a whole bunch of the open source software to implement these common things. No longer was it, I'm writing a DHCP server in bare metal event-driven model on a microcontroller. Um, so when we went for uh, working on Zaius and, and opening that, we decided Let's go for this open stack. Um, we're going to go with an A-speed BMC because that's what everybody else had been doing. And we didn't really have any guidance on what to choose. So we just kind of followed along with what was known. We decided early on we really wanted to contribute and build a community. Google's goal in participating in open, is open compute, open power, all these different open initiatives, is that we want to actually be able to leverage the community to drive a lot of the new developments and innovation. We have been in this space for a long time. We want to share a lot of our expertise and move it from the internal proprietary implementations that we've done that work well for us and start to share that knowledge and expertise and develop a solution that works for more people. And we want to do that because we also want to be able to have our engineers focus on some of the newer product developments and challenges that we see as we go to even larger scales. So with that, we really put a lot of effort into not only consuming the code and 
cleaning it up and making implementations in internal repos, we decided early on that all of our code commits go directly to upstream. So every, all the work that we do, our entire team, um, I have uh, six people now working on OpenBMC, um, and all of them participate on the mailing list, all of them are in the IRC channels, they send up pull requests constantly, or code reviews, and uh, the only code that we keep as internal patches are either things that have already been submitted upstream but have not actually gotten th fully through review, and we need it sooner, and things that um, we never intend to send upstream, which is usually what I refer to as things I'm too embarrassed to show. Um, and a lot of joining into the community meant actually investing in parts that I would rather not spend the time in, but I need to. So things like going through and actually cleaning up some of the device driver support. We had a system where we needed to be an I2C slave, so we jumped in and actually implemented slave mode on the I2C interfaces and submitted that upstream. Um, and basically, anytime we run into a situation that we need to do that development and that part of the system will do that. I had a person who did um, the AST2500 support in U-Boot and putting that into the mainline support, uh, at least the basic support. So, we actively try to be within the community, helping the community, and when people show up and want to do patches and things, I have told my team, go ahead, help people get through their code reviews. Help actually review their code, help them walk through the process, help them figure it out. And that's how we build a bigger community that all works together and, and contributes to this. So a couple of the use cases for us in terms of what we do with OpenBMC, like, like you've heard, the uh, hyperscale, there aren't a whole lot of requirements. Um, in our case, probably the number one use case is sort of, is our remote debugging. And really this is limited to over NCSI, I'm going to do power control, a read-only console, and collection of postcodes. That's it. Now we specifically chose to do a read-only console and have the overall functionality be extremely limited to narrow the security exposure. This is the sum total of what we expose on our network interfaces on our BMCs today. Now that may change over time, but this is what we've settled on um, to start with. So this is actually pretty easy to achieve with OpenBMC. Um, we have some more details in that we decided to use some non-standard protocols for actually doing this. So there's some work for us. Um, but this was our bare minimum. One of the other things that we do is because of our long legacy of doing all of our health monitoring via the host, we heavily leverage the host to BMC interface because we still report all the monitoring data through the host, even though it's collected by the BMC now. So in our case, all sorts of the environmental state, hardware software configuration, et cetera, we collect all this information. And today it's sort of a mix between the host and the BMC. Because of the system architecture, the BMC doesn't actually have all the data that we would want. Um, it now has a lot of the temp sensors and overall control of, you know, knows about the power sequencers and power rails. But it doesn't, for example, know a lot of the um, internal state of what the host processor is doing. It doesn't really have any visibility into storage controllers and lots of other aspects of the system. So, and we are, uh, on our Zaya systems and all of our BMC systems going forward, we are using IPMI today over LPC link, and it's working, though I think we want to see, uh, we want to see development in that area. This is an important piece for us, and we want to figure out how to do this better. And that's kind of where we're going. Um, when I talk with enterprise companies that are doing large-scale deployments, they're very familiar with deploying the proprietary solutions from your tier one OEMs. So you have, you know, HP's um, management solutions, and you have Dell's rack. And one of the nice features there is everything is done in an agentless model. I no longer have to trust the host processor to tell me about the state of the machine. And so when I think about my environment, uh, today I know that I can, I have full control over the host processor, uh, at least the bare metal version of the OS running on it, as well as the BMC. But I also know customers that deliver bare metal uh, as a service, in which case the BMC is their only way to control the machine. They intentionally don't have access to the host processor. And so how do you actually do things like know that you've experienced a failure inside the, the system? 
How do you know that a hard drive has had a reader? Um, those are things that have been done on a proprietary basis. There are some standards out there leading in this direction, but there's not much in the way of development that's happened in the open space or even in the ODM market of being able to buy that as an off-the-shelf solution. So we've been looking at this about how does the system architecture need to change? Uh, how do we actually represent the entire uh, physical layout and logical layout of the, the system? Um, we usually have the problem of, I have noticed this PCIe link is at, trained at the wrong speed. Which card is that? So knowing which slot every single bus is mapped to, or this I squared C bus is stuck. Which sensor is attached to that and you know, which component is it on so I can replace it? So getting to that level of detail in terms of the BMC knowing about the system architecture is something that we're trying to work toward. As we do that, we look toward MCTP as a, a, a solution that we want to explore for the, certainly for host communication with the BMC to give a more flexible data path there, but also for routing through all the other components. We're trying to figure out how does the BMC actually talk to other, all these other devices in a sideband way throughout the system without having a lot of cables. Cables are horrible in our environment. Um, so we don't know what the answers are here. We suspect it's going to require a lot of work across multiple players in the industry to figure out how to do this well and to do it in an open way. Now, as we talk about the BMC to host communication, one other aspect of that is um, we're, if you think of a model where the host processor is untrusted, and the BMC becomes your foothold in the system. The BMC then becomes more important to the boot sequence and being able to look control the host processor. And so we're looking at, well, when the system boots, how do I actually talk to the host over time? And so there's some things of, there's a gradual trend toward using eSpy for boot flashes. There's a gradual trend toward um, away from LPC. Okay, that's great. But do I need to look at other interfaces too? Do I want to use PCIe from the host to the, to the BMC as, as that MCTP path? And what else would I actually want to run over that? Do I want to use that for how I do firmware updates? Or do I want to use USB and emulate mass storage to be, do my initial boot instead of relying on Pixie? So there's a lot of different options that we're looking at and trying to explore to understand if my sole control is the BMC, how do I actually get the host processor to do what I want? So uh, while I'm up here talking and being very present, I'm actually more focused on the overarching initiatives that Google's in, in terms of open. Um, and Nancy Yuan here in the audience is also my technical lead, specifically on OpenBMC. So feel free to get in contact with us. I'm always happy to chat about these things, and hopefully this has been useful. Any questions? Chris, check your phone. Uh, so last but not least, we have Jeff and John doing uh, redfish profiles. Je Jeff's doing, okay. Just Jeff. Oh, you want to use my laptop, oh, don't you? Uh, you got HDMI or? Uh, good question. I have no idea. So while Jeff's getting ready, Jeff and John have been kind enough to be, be educating us on Redfish during the OCP management meeting. So it's been a lot of presentations and a lot of work done in that area. So this is about the uh, profile that we've been discussing. Excellent. All right, thanks, Norm. Uh, I guess I just wanted to start with the, it was great to see all the Redfish gets mentioned about every five minutes. I think I can have a clicker now. So uh, I'm hoping that we'll see actual contributions coming to the OpenBMC stuff so that so we can have the 
conversation about how to improve it and and uh, uh, how to get more how to get more support into you know into it beyond what we're talking about today. Uh, so you know, I, I, so I, I, I guess I'm glad to hear that we don't have to the why redfish and why it's you know why why we should be using it for rest and so on and so forth. That's great. I'm tired of giving that speech. So uh, the uh, what we wanted to get into, and this is again, this is sort of a, a, a recap of, of conversations we've been having for uh, for many months on the on the management calls. Uh, the uh, the the issue that, and I'll talk a little bit about this. You may have seen these slides before, and I'll get into the actual meat of this. Uh, the, uh, the the issue we've had uh, with uh, with with folks that have been trying to adopt redfish is the, you know, the common question is, what do I need to support? And you know, and our answer is whatever makes sense for your product. And then people, you know, that that, that becomes a well, yeah, but what's important? So. Uh, and this, and the, the reason that comes about is because the schemas for redfish are are growing, you know, very uh, dramatically over the last couple of years from from doing the the basics of systems management and really, you know, server focused things are basically the the coverage of of, of what was available from IPMI uh, to now encompass uh, lots of uh, the storage product realm, the networking stuff uh, that that you know, that John Leung is heavily involved with. We have the uh, the DSIM. Uh, you know, power and cooling information, things coming in from the green grid. So the the coverage of what you can manage, you know, via Redfish is is growing a lot. And I guess the other thing I should mention is that there's also we and we have some work in progress that was published this week as well for uh, for doing what we call Redfish device enablement, which is the how to do Redfish over MCTP and and other transports to go get device information incorporated and do all that agentless, uh, you know, in band. Uh, stuff, uh, you know, the host interface support is there as well. So there's there's lots of avenues there to to uh, to extend and and to to support. And the question is, well, how do I know what I need to support? Number one and number two, from a from a client perspective, if you're a software developer or somebody trying to use, you know, the the applications to actually manage these all these products, what can I expect to be there? What should I rely on? And so that's where this concept of, a, of an interoperability profile comes in. And, and I'm sorry, it's kind of a mouthful of word, but there's, there's there has, there just no other good word that wasn't already used for something else. So, uh, so the interoper, interoperability profile uh, is, a, uh, is really a simple machine readable but human readable document that describes effectively just the checklist. You know, here are the, the at, down at the property level, you know, on a schema by schema basis or a resource by resource basis, what things do I have to see in an implementation to meet uh, the needs of a, of a particular product, a particular use case. So, you know, for what we would normally talk about here is a, you know, a very high, highly scale out environment, you know, we've been trying to focus on, you know, what would a, uh, you know, a, a fairly, you know, generic, uh, uh, you know, very commodity-based, you know, one U, two U server. What would it look like? What do I need to have it? And so, uh, so that's kind of our first target. But the the idea was to have this profile document that would list all those things out. We could then publish that, uh, you know, and obviously agree upon what the content is. And now the developers can go use that as their implementation guides. Uh, and then you can take uh, tools to go validate that to make sure that. Uh, you know that 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 the uh, that an implementation conforms to that uh, to that profile, uh, and then obviously have the documentation, all that informs that that folks can go then you know develop software that rely on those things to be there. So um, the uh, the things I will mention here, I'm, I, I don't I'm read all these slides to you, but uh, the, the idea is we do want to we, we want to keep these profiles fairly simple, so they're they're not horribly horribly complicated. From a you know I I, I don't get into the really uh, the, the, you know the you can dream up requirements that we would not support and 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 so we kind of did that on purpose number one to try to keep it simple uh, but also if you're trying to specify a a this checklist form you know down to the level that you're trying to dictate hardware implementations you're doing yourself a disservice and you've probably gone beyond what we're trying to accomplish so as a for instance uh, you know, in, and we'll see here later in the slides. Uh, the uh, you know, the, one of the things you can specify is uh, you know, I, I want a fan, or excuse me, I want you know, I want a fan to uh, uh, I want two fans in the system. Well, we mark that as as uh, as as available in the uh, uh, in the profile, but it's marked as an if implemented feature, meaning it's not necessarily required. And the reason is, well, if somebody comes up with a water cooled system. 
wouldn't have any fans, you don't want that system to fail the profile and says it doesn't meet the, the needs of the, of the customer because, well, it clearly does. Uh, we ran into the same thing uh, looking at, the, uh, at, at this, uh, this OCP profile with, uh, with the temperature sensors because it said that uh, there should be a temperature sensor for the system, the one for the ambient air temp, and, and one for each of the two CPUs makes sense except that we don't want to make sure we don't want to dictate from the redfish profile that you have to have two CPUs so we say that every CPU has to have a temp set has to have a temperature but not that you have to have two CPUs so again it's trying to make sure that that we make these profiles you know long lasting that they're not they're not enforcing hardware requirements if you want to enforce a hardware requirement you know lots of ways to lots of ways to do that but but we don't want to make that part of the management requirements so if you have two processors they both have to be managed but I'm not going to be the one that says you have to have two so uh, so that said you know the, the 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 concepts of the of the profile allow it to incorporate multiple profiles so you can build these things on top of each other we're, we're kind of expecting that we'll take a uh, this first profile and uh, and use that as a as a good trial balloon to basically you know set set a, a level playing field for and then some common ground for the initial software uh, that folks would be using especially with openBMC so uh, get there, and then we'll start raising the bar from there with additional profiles that will reference the original one. So, uh, so once you define one of these, they stick. You know, if you want to define something that's that's more inclusive, you, know, you build another one that can build on top of it. Uh, so let me get into the kind of the where this is. So the uh, uh, the, the idea of, of the profile document itself, it's a JSON document, but it's it's uh, I tried to make it really uh, very simple. So there's not a lot of deep structure to it. It's it's very uh, wordy in English uh, because it, it, they're not you know they're not this is not a performance uh, based. Uh, uh, you know, use case here. So uh, it's trying to be as human readable as possible, uh, but obviously can be still used by the uh, uh, by tools to go do the validation and conformance checking, and also for uh, for automatically generating some documentation. Uh, so the idea is that that anyone can produce one of these. Uh, DMTF, we're going to set up a uh, repository for these, so that you know, if you can sub if you create one, you can submit it, and we'll publish it on the DMTF website. That all process is kind of you know we're we're going through it now as we're trying to do the first one, which is kind of the reason I want to get this one, you know, uh, knocked out, so we can, you know, we can make sure that the process works and 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 get those floodgates moving. Okay, like so, like I said, there's a there, this is all the, the sort of the background is what you what what is available for de, for developing and publishing uh, a profile. So there is a, like I said, a machine readable JSON uh, document that's uh, defined by a JSON schema. Uh, it's uh, there is a specification that basically tells you how to how, how to write that JSON document, and there's the, that's available from the DMTF website. Uh, and I have I need to change the term there. It says creating open source tools for the conformance testing. Well, we've already created those tools. They are actually out on GitHub uh, under the uh, DMTF's uh, repository called the Profile. John, help me. Profile val. It's a Profile Conformance Checker. Oh, interoperability validator. That's right. Yes, yeah, interoperability validator. So it's it's out on GitHub now, and it, and uh, it's been tested against uh, the this stuff, you know, effectively at a, kind of the point nine level. Uh, so it's it's certainly ready to go. Uh, we just need a profile that's been approved uh, to <laughs> for them to, to actually use. Uh, and then lastly, we're also we have a documentation generator that we use uh, to to create human uh, human and end user documentation. We're going to have that. Uh, tool enhanced to uh, consume these profile documents and spit out uh, a basically a, you know your own specification for uh, you know for here's here's what this profile looks like and here's how you you know make sure that people are conforming to it and why you've justified you know all the justification for what's in here and so forth so so trying to make all the tools and the ecosystem available to to make this all work. <laughs> so I get to talk too fast. Uh, okay, so uh, then this is uh, things I've gone over before, so I'm going to skip skip most of this. But uh, basically, the uh, like I said, trying to keep the document, uh, try to keep the profile uh, document uh, and functionality, you know, uh, you know, try to keep it simple, not not overly complex. But we did make it so that you know, if if we need to add more functionality, we certainly can over time. It's just a JSON document. Uh, 
So you know you can do simple things like require everything in a schema to be present. You can require certain pieces, and you can mark them things as uh, as uh, as re you know require. Excuse me, the term is mandatory, meaning it must be there. Recommended is I'd like it to be there, uh, and if implemented, which is a well, if you if you have this, then you must have that kind of thing. So uh, so those are the sort of the levels of of, of conformance. Um, and then we have uh, uh, a, a ability to make some conditional requirements, and so this is to allow for things like, if there is a CPU, then I want you to have, you know, a, 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 I'm sorry, if there's a CPU uh, temperature sensor, there needs to be <laughs> matching CPU, obviously. Uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, and and there's some other structural pieces there that just work for various uh, for various use cases in the you know in the in the schemas. Okay, so let me get into the, this is actually the new stuff. Uh, so this is from the uh, uh, the interoperability profile that we have uh, proposed. Uh, I, oh, thank you very much. Uh, so what happens? You drop like twenty percent of humidity from Houston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, so uh, so the the goal of the profile uh, was to. Uh, uh, was really just to move the requirements from the from the remote machine management interface that OCP published in 2014, I think it was now, <laughs> and just move that into you know what it would look like to support that with Redfish. And so, uh, so that was the first goal was to to take the take the machine management spec, basically port all those things that were done with IPMI, and and allow it to be implemented with Redfish instead. And then secondly, we wanted to uh, ensure that we were being inclusive from, uh, from a Redfish 1.0 perspective. So when we uh, shipped the Redfish spec now two years ago, uh, you know, that had really trying to get to the same um, basic set of features, you know, IPMI over LAN that was uh, uh, commonly available. And so we didn't want to make, uh, didn't want to exclude anybody that had shipped a Redfish 1.0 implementation you know, if they had followed that kind of guidance, they should also fit this profile. <laughs> and so what, what I mean by that is we've added, in those two years, we've added things like firmware update capability, there's power supply management, there's lots of other things that people have said, yeah, you know, that's a really good thing, it ought to be there. Well, that wasn't in the remote machine management spec, it wasn't in Redfish 1.0, so I would hate to go tell somebody that your implementation doesn't meet this profile, you know, because you're, you know, because you, you were following what we had done back then. So. Uh, so that said, I want us to kind of get through this one and then come back and do a more richer, you know, 2017, 2018 kind of, you know, okay, now you've done the basics, let's, let's, let's bring you up to the, you know, present day as to what our everyone's thinking is, because I hear things like firmware update, I think it's pretty important, I hear, you know, so. <laughs> uh, so, uh, like I said, we, we you know, so, so the, the, I think the biggest thing for this group is to, you know, really two things, and you'll get, you'll see this on my last slide, but basically I, I want to, I want us to get to, you know, an agreement. I don't know what we say this is an approval. I don't really honestly know what we do from an OCP perspective. Say, yeah, this is all good. That makes sense. Uh, and then you know, we will go publish this on the DMTF website, and make it you know, obviously freely available. Uh, the uh, the question is, you know, what what if any naming do we want to put on it? Uh, we are, you know, DMTF. We've had this conversation. We would welcome to have the OCP name on that profile. If they want to say contributed by or you know whatever we want to do, but uh, I think that's a conversation for this group to have, and also for the OCP uh, actual project folks to say you know from legal clearance and whatnot what's what's all allowed. I hate for us to hold that up much longer, so we can always change the name later. By the way, so if uh, if we need to move quickly and then uh, and then add something later, we can do that too. <clears throat> and 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 really the the end goal of all this is to basically encourage folks to go use this profile and to use Redfish to go to go manage OCP product and, I, and I, I, from from the like I said the amount of times we've heard Redfish today I think I think we're we're over that hump so so let me get into the kind of the real quick uh, and I said that this isn't going into gory detail but uh, but this is what's in the in the uh, basic server profile so uh, and starting from the uh, the root piece there's the the basic system identification the UUID and basic user account management. Uh, the uh, on the manager or the BMC side, uh, I think pretty much everything you would expect to be there. So the you know the firmware version, uh, the location of the serial console, uh, the BMC's event log, uh, and then obviously the uh, the all the IP configuration, 
uh, for the for the BMC itself, and that also needs to be uh, settable, I believe, from uh, from the uh, from the interface as well. Question. Sir, so this is just a high level view, though. You're going to get very very specific on schemas and I don't know what you call them, like the properties and the methods. Yeah, it's it's actually funny because the, the the you know since Redfish kind of you know makes that stuff try to make it you know simple uh, that this is probably seventy five percent of the actual properties. I mean, there's a property called UID, there's a property called firmware version, but yeah, there's a few things I kind of combine down here just to structurally make it you know more palatable. But but yes, the the profile goes down at the property level and says you have to have this this and this. Yeah, because that's that's the machine readable part of it. If you don't have that, I can't tell you the you know, the firmware engineer won't, you know, will miss. I just, yeah, I don't want any assumptions to be made here that our firmware engineers are. Right, yes, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 because I see, I sort of gloss over, I say like, yeah, you gotta have your IP address. Well, that certainly means there's a subnet and there's a mask, you know, and it has to be in a, you know, <laughs> the dot form. So yeah, all those rigid requirements are all enforced by schema and by the document and by the, the, uh, by the uh, profile document. So yes, it's, it's all in there, but I'm, I'm simplifying it for, for us in the room, right? So, uh, but yes, if there's anything I'm missing, let me know. And I, I, I did go through and I think I called out all the, all the major items, but I think there were one or two I think I even still missed. But, um, but yeah, so, so yeah, again, on the BMC, you know, pretty much everything you would see there from the housekeeping part. So then I get into the more interesting stuff. And so in the Redfish parlance, the chassis or the physical view of the system, you know, we've got the asset tag, uh, we had internal discussions, uh, lots of people, some people had SKU, some people had part number, you know, it really depends on kind of, I think, where you grew up, some people had both. Uh, so you know what, it was, it's really infor good information, so we used one of the profile functions and said you have to have one or the other, or both, but you know, you don't have to have SKU, you don't have to have part number, but you have to have one of those, so we use that. Uh, as, it, was, it was a nice little trial balloon to make sure the profile worked right. So, you know, manufacturer model, serial number, uh, you know, the, being, able to, being able to see uh, the power state uh, of the chassis. The power state control is actually on the system side or the logical view, so you'll see that here on the next page. Uh, there's also the recommendation for the indicator LED on a chassis, but that's also replicated on the system side, so the requirements are mostly on the system side. Again, next page. Um, on the power side, this is an area where it is fairly small because this is what was in machine management spec, uh, and so I think uh, I think in the next iteration or the you know the, the next profile we would go work on uh, would have things like the power supplies and individual information about you know each of the supplies as at least as a recommendation. So it is not in here because it was not in machine management spec. Uh, power limit is in there, so but a single power uh, you know power cap power limit uh, function is there. Uh, on the thermal side, uh, fan speeds and the identifiers, you know, you know be, be, uh, find out what your fan number is. Uh, that is there, and like I said but, you know, previously, uh, there's a minimum of uh, three temperature sensors required. There, you need to have an intake, uh, the system level or a system board sensor, and then one on each of the CPUs. No, because that's a that's a physical that's a implementation thing, not a management problem, right? You know, we, I I can't enforce you from management that you put the sensor in the right place, but you know, but if you call it a CPU one, it's you know, it, it is what it is. So, it, like I said, so trying to trying to stay out of the realm of mandating and dictating hardware because we're a management spec. But I guess the point is, you can still make a really dumb system. <laughs> Uh, and so this is now on the logical side of the of, of the view, uh, and really we're kind of where most folks are used to seeing. And this is the you know what, what Redfish calls the computer system uh, uh, schema. So again, asset tag, uh, serial number, model number, uh, manufacturer, SKU and part number, the UUID, the BIOS version. One of the one of the ones people ask for a lot. Uh, power state is here. This is where all the power and reset capabilities. Like I guess I didn't call that out, but that's this is where your reboot and reset capability comes in. Uh, the uh, indicator LED need to be able to set that here. Uh, being able, and the uh, uh, let's see next is the boot source. So being able to do the one-time boot, uh, uh, selecting uh, the basically the the one-time boot to Pixie and go back to the system. That's uh, you know we've heard that one a few before. Uh, on the uh, on the rest of the inventory, the only things that are mentioned are the kind of the the the, the you know the big money pieces, the CPU quantities and models. Uh, and total system memory. So dim inventory was something that was added in Redfish, uh, you know, last year. Uh, so again, didn't 
didn't meet that first kind of cut for the profile. Also, was not in part of machine management spec. So we've 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 pushed that out to a you know to a later version of this. Um, the uh, the other thing that's in here, and this is all just on the recommendation level. Um, it has it was interesting. It has been done a lot in OEM space in IPMI, uh, and that's to get information about the host NICs, so uh, the MAC address, link status, the speed, and, and you know, and the IP configuration. Uh, all that is all really good. Uh, however, most, if not all, of that requires uh, some level of host software, and that was not something that was in host management. wasn't something we did in Redfish 1.0, and and not something that was necessarily part of IPMI. So we that we've only made that recommendation here. Uh, did think it was important to at least mark it as recommended because it, it is extremely valuable information. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the way that the, the conformance tool works is basically you know, it will flag you as a fault if you, something is, is mandatory and if you don't have it. If it's recommended, it'll just say, you know, it was recommended that you had this and whether you have it or not, you, you can, you know, you can make a judgment from that. The recommended is really not so much for the conformance tools, it's really for the documentation to say, you know what, here's the list of stuff you got to have and here's the stuff you probably should have and, and I think from a from a group perspective, it's also a, you know, we can't require this because of, for some reason, like I said, this was, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, meet the needs of uh, the, the, the remote machine management spec, but to state a direction is that, you know what, this is recommended, but you can expect the next time we come to this, that's going to be required. So it's really more for the humans and the developers than, than it is for the conformance tools. Um, I, I think it's a, it's one avenue to take it, and that's why that's why we have the documentation generator, so that the folks creating these profiles can go actually make some notes to that effect to say, you know what, we made this recommended. You should expect the next revision of this or an, uh, the next version of this profile, um, you know, to take that. So, but it, it, if if that's a concern, we can I can change that language because uh, it wasn't intent to make that you know cast in stone. It's a it's a you know recommend. There's lots of ways. There's lots of reasons people recommend things. <laughs> uh, we didn't get into like having five different levels of these things. Like you know, it's it's recommended, it's optional, it's suggest, you know, it's like uh, you can get you can go overboard with this, and nobody knows what they're for. So, oh, on the Nick LEDs. Oh, the indicator. Yeah, that was actually uh, that that was uh, uh, mandatory in the remote, remote machine management spec to have a to some have some sort of indicator LED. So do your platforms not have it? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, it doesn't violate the spec. It would, it would means it would meet the profile. And so, you know, and so, uh, the, the, again, the goal of the profile is for for folks that are trying to produce systems, trying to write software to to use those systems. What can they expect to be there? So, you know, if your platform doesn't meet the profile, well, if, if it meets your requirements, who cares, right? I mean, it's it, so you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to give too heavy a weight to this, but this is trying to give really it's really for the software ecosystem to have a. Uh, an idea of what they can rely on to be there, uh, so that when they go create some nice web GUI, that you don't have a whole bunch of gray boxes filled out because the thing didn't have half the things that you you coded for, right? So, and also from a management perspective, you know, when folks want to go say to the OCP vendors to say, you know, for this class of product, you know, do you support this? Um, I don't want them to come to me to say, as a vendor, I don't want them to come to me to say, hey, do you support the following 700 properties, you know, out of the Redfish schemas, here's the checklist, you know, and then, you know, then I get 10 sales guys yelling at me because we have to go through the thing with a fine tooth cone to make, it's much easier to say, do you support the Redfish, you know, OCP basic server profile, do you support the, the version 2 profile, do you support, you know, you can come at me with four or five of those profiles and then I can give you an answer and it's probably already on my sales sheets, right? So, so it's just giving us a shorthanded common language to get to, to get to yes <laughs> on all this, so. So you know, and that, and that, and that said, you know, we have not. This, as I said, this is a you know, just a recapping of what's in this profile. Uh, you know, I would like us to get to closure on this. We don't have to come to closure on that today. If we want to discuss the what's in or what's out, happy to have that conversation so that we can we can come to a conclusion. But we, you know, do want to kind of wrap this up though. Sir. Can you highlight some of the differences between this and the OEM debug like the I? 
can't. Well, one of the things that is not in the arrest form that we need to kind of fix up is Red just did a great job of just telling you uh, programmatically <coughs> what uh, functions can be called. Uh, right now, the rest, the Depot's rest is not. And I like that a lot about that. So that you can say, oh, I can move from C world or this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Some systems don't ever get this guy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And on that root source argument, including UEFI targets, do you have more specific than UEFI targets? Uh, actually, no. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the the just what Chris was mentioning, but but the uh, the yeah you know, we try to back all the anything that's a string, we try to back it up with uh, with an, in, with uh, enumerations, uh, and so like I said you know in the boot source if you want to set you know select the one time uh, or select the boot source override that's what the term is for Redfish, uh, you know you select CD-ROM uh, you know USB uh, floppy is in there CD uh, hard drive. And then one of those is UEFI target as a, as a generic term. There's a separate property that then says, here's the device string for the UEFI boot target that I actually want you to go to. So it's not part of the enumerations, but you know, that's, you know, that, that, because you have to learn those from the system they, and they're different on every system. Uh, and so, yeah, so that it's, it's. But are you mandating which ones have to be there? No. Uh, no, and I I have to go back and look at the profile. I don't think we called out, uh, we didn't call out any of the allowable values for the for the boot source override. Just that you had to have you had to have the ability to boot source. If we did, if I did, and I and I wrote most of it. So if I did, it probably would have been Pixie, uh, Pixie hard drive, and you know I don't know if you know that that was probably the only of the two that we probably called out. Because yeah, I don't want to you know I don't want to man again try not to mandate hardware. So I don't want you to have to have a CD ROM drive or you fail. All right. I certainly don't want to have you have to floppy and fail. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and and if it's and I think that's why we want to discuss this to set you know to really is to set a baseline is that in order to meet the goals of OCP and the you know the whatever the management you know framework is, you have to have this. If if we kind of you know and and so if the answer comes back, yeah, we don't report that in a lot of our systems. Well, you know, we can just mark it as a recommended piece. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but what does that do for me, though? I guess is. You know, you know, oh, okay. Let, uh, I guess yeah. So yeah, and, and John's looking at me nodding. He's like, so one of the things we're doing in the conformance test suite for the, for the profile is it does not come up with a fail. Uh, you know, it's not. It's not. A, it's not. You know, you don't get the smiley face or the frowny face. It's a basically here's a report, and so you would come out and say you're missing this, you're missing that. And and so yeah again it's like so as as you as a customer if you say hey I you know I care about the profile but you know I don't care about that and so if it comes up with that failure then fine uh, <laughs> exactly and that's what that was absolutely we're trying to avoid so so yeah I, I and and again you know just saying this doesn't doesn't take anyone's uh, uh, doesn't make any of your software developers doesn't get them off the hook for writing good code to deal with missing properties. You know, so yeah, it should be able to gray out the system memory without you know giving a 404 error. <laughs> so you know, uh, it, that, it, that's not the goal either. But but in the for the most part, yeah, you ought to be able to see all this stuff. So it's just like I mean, I would go ahead and code up the fan display, and if the system doesn't happen to have fans, well then, you know, then it, you don't have that. But that should be still a fairly normal occurrence. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get one or? You know? <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I think that's a. Yeah. Yeah. I hope they contribute that. I'd love to see that so we can get up. <laughs> Yeah, 
in terms of uh, you mean in terms of the Open BMC? Yeah, because I mean, from a from the, from the rest of the vendor world, the rest of the firmware vendor, we've all got Redfish implementations. We're all kind of trying to figure out what make sure make sure we're all supporting the same fields too. So, uh, I I am not aware of any, John. But yeah. Do we, we lose the Microsoft guy? Because he, cause he yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Drag him back in. No, because <laughs> no, honestly, the, 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 look, it sounded like they had obviously done quite a bit. And since he was talking about performance tuning and some other things, it's like, oh, uh, that's, that's long past the, we're still trying to figure out how to walk phase. So, no good news. Yeah. Yeah. So, so are we talking? So, obviously, within the DMTF, obviously, we here we talk about it. Uh, we're we're trying to get we well uh, we we have a public forum that's the the at redfishforum.com. The, you know, the people can ask questions, and we've had a few things that come up, and, you know, the people looking for implementations. So from that, from a community stuff, yeah, we're still trying to, to, you know, to get that kind of that critical mass of folks that, you know, that are all like-minded and talk about things. From the standards body standpoint, you know, all we're doing is publishing the specs. Um, we, have, uh, we have done a couple things. Uh, just recently, we have a new page on the DMTF site that actually lists all of the open source tools. Uh, that are you know that are available that use you know if you use Redfish and you have an open source tool, give us a pointer and we'll add it to our uh, you know add it to our list. Uh, and those are obviously the links are all up there. Um, you know implementation wise, again because we uh, as a standards body we don't get into the implementation pieces, so we haven't done anything. I don't think we would have any qualms at listing a link back to the Open BMC project if that was uh, you know if that was something you guys wanted. Uh, I don't think we'd have any issue with that, um, but it's 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 mo we've been mostly focused on the client and on the consumer side of this in terms of the outreach to the community because we because we were all doing all the chicken stuff we needed all the people doing the egg parts. Hey, hey Jeff, yeah. Uh, well, wow! Well, if you took uh, if you took I think all the schemas now I wouldn't even I wouldn't even hesitate I, I don't know if I can give a number it's 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 well over a thousand. Maybe two, if you take all the all the storage stuff, but in the in this profile, I think it's like a hundred and hundred, maybe less. In the rec, in the rec yeah, because that, you know, so just take yeah, something like that. And and I, again, as we saw through the list, I don't think there's anything in there that would surprise anyone. Uh, the stuff that I didn't list on here was some of the structural elements. So there's OData links and you know and the the, the automatic discovery and pieces of that that have to be there just to make Redfish work. But uh, but that's all just you know housekeeping. I have a proposal to, uh, to this so, Go ahead. Go ahead. Are you done? I, yeah, well, that's, there's, there's my done. Sorry. So, yeah, as, as an open source community. I, 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 I'm so sorry, Jeff. I no, was no, presumptuous because I'm assuming you're, you were done there. But yeah, here's, my, here's my proposal, and, and I apologize for, you know, kind of late entry on this. But um, if, if you love beer like I do and you drink a lot of it at night, you can't go to sleep until you stay up and read specs. And so this weekend it was, it was, uh, yeah. So I was busy reading OCP profiles. Um, I'm sorry, Redfish profiles. And, um, and of course, after reading that, absolutely. 
Um, but also, I've learned quite a bit just listening to the presentations earlier. So, um, so today there's there's a OCP uh, list, of, yeah, list of properties. There's 429 of those on that list, and there's a recommendation that 115 become part of the OCP profile. So, you know, what we heard today is Microsoft has a Redfish implementation in their Open BMC. They're I, I suspect Intel may have some features that they've built into that. Um, you know, maybe IBM has so some features built in. Not sure, right? Um, here's my thinking: is if we start off with taking the suggestion that that kind of sets the bar at 115, we're setting it pretty low. And I keep thinking that what we really need to do is under. I mean, ideally, you want to support everything. Okay, all 429. Um, but so, oh. yeah. So they're they're going to be. So I'm just saying. That ideally, you support everything, and then you got it, your bases covered. Okay. But there are certain features or certain properties that don't make sense for all platforms. Okay. And so I think we have to go through and say, is there properties that were defined that you know really don't offer any value? Probably not going to get used, um, you know. Can't be supported because of architectural um, implementation. So I, I really want to be architectural agnostic. Okay, so you want to kind of eliminate those features, and maybe that comes down to let's say, you know, half. Let's say between two and three hundred properties that really make sense, and then we look at that list and say, okay, some of those, a subset of those, are applicable to servers. A subset to storage, a subset to network products, and we actually end up building a matrix, right? And so, if you if you had a an appliance that did all three functions, you may need to support all 200. But if you had a, a, a an appliance that did storage or an appliance that did, um, you know, networking, you may only have 100 or 150 properties, um, and that becomes the profile that we support, very specific to the type of appliance the device that we're doing. The goal is set the bar, set the bar as high as we can, given that we've already done a bunch of work and that we've kind of agreed that we want to we want to um, we want to bring these code bases together. So let's capture what we've already done. And so my suggestion is start with what we have, the the this Excel chart that has the 429 properties say, okay, let's go through each of those and decide which ones don't make sense and start with 429 and keep whittling it down till we get to a reasonable number that is, one, architectural agnostic, and two, is that we have a reasonable path to implement it. So, you know, and that means that we, you know, we need to look at, at what the community can provide in terms of open sourcing. What do we have out of these various code bases that we can contribute to? So that's that's really what we've already done. Is we, so that, that that list of all the properties, we kind of went through that and mapped those to what the machine management spec had, what was commonly available in those platforms, and and made this sort of limited yeah, scope. Oh, to them, right? Yeah. And you know, so we we went through that list and then trimmed it down to again just say take out the architectural requirements, take out anything that was uh, uh, not applicable to to these platforms. And kind of came down to this list. Now, the diff the slight difference that from what you said, and we can and we can easily carve this into the into two pieces if we want. Was there's a there's a list of of properties that make you just a good management or a good managed device. So that's the UUID, uh, the indicator LEDs, perhaps you know, but model number, serial number, GUIDs, uh, that kind of stuff. That would be like anything that's an OCP product, be it a server, a storage, a networking, or a, a or a, a you know an air conditioning unit. Would be a, a basic set of those. Yeah. We can define that, and then basically that would just be cutting my server profile in half. Say, here's the first part. This is just a good, a good managed citizen, and then the other half would be here's the computer system stuff, and I would, I would just basically do that as an include. Uh, so our profiles can reference other profiles. So we would say like, here's the OCP basic management spec, let's say, and then here's the basic server spec, which you know basically first line include basic platform or you know, include the basics. Now the system stuff, and then the storage one and the networking one could do the same thing. Uh, so we can we can do that easily. But I think we've already gone through that as a group uh, to to go through that list. Uh, you know that. So do you guys think that it is that we, we 
we're setting the bar at kind of the lowest common denominator, or are we? We're setting the yes. It's it's kind of it's setting the bar to probably about a 2014 system so of. Like well, I don't want to. I don't want to buy a 2014 model. Right? I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, but. And 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 and, the, and I think you're out of the room. But the important part is <clears throat> is yes, I agree. I don't want anybody buying a 2014 system either. But we have to get something out. We have to have that baseline, and we also don't want to exclude anything that is already shipping that can already meet these things. And so we want to be inclusive from that to say, you know, if you're an OCP platform and you implemented Redfish, you should have already met this thing. Maybe you had one or two things, but at the most part, you got to do it now. We do that and like get that out, get that thing out, you know, behind us. And I think what we would would like to do, I think this is the DMTF would like to see this, and all the members and I want to see this too is, we've done a lot of work since 2014. Uh, you know, y'all have had expectations raised since 2014. Things like firmware update and I can you give me the four other things that are you know really high on everyone's list. This stuff's all available. It wasn't in the, in the management specs, but let's go do that profile, and that's the. And I don't care how we call them. We can call this one the OCP basic, and this is the OCP 2018 stretch goal. You know, go call it whatever we want, but we we wanted to get that baseline out there so that these guys trying to do implementations could code to something. So, so today, uh, if, if a person implements a chip with the supported platforms, there's very few utilities or It's a yeah. We are we are in a strong chicken and egg phase. Exactly. <clears throat> the platform, if, if all that's supported is the the platform would be close to useless. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so that is insufficient to say. Oh, there. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Talking so that's that. I'll keep talking. So it's like talking to your phone. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so that is it's a 2014 phone. It is. <laughs> um, you know, so so just looking at the Redfish profile is insufficient. Somehow we have to incorporate, you know, kind of the de facto standard of IPMI. We need the 2014 and the 1998 version, don't we? Uh, uh, and that's don't, a question, so. really. Uh, but the, uh, <clears throat> I, I think so. I think yeah. People already have IPMI. Exactly, exactly. But we don't have that in the profile. So I think we have to go back and take the, the we, um, in terms of defining what the, 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 the OCP profile is for platforms, we can, ha we can look at the properties, the Redfish properties we support, but we also have to say we have IPMI-based uh, I'll call them properties, but you know commands or. But that's how we construct this, right? So I took the remote management hardware ma spec that OCP has, yeah, which, which is was, IPMI, I, and I mapped it to Redfish. So you have one-to-one -one correspondence between what you get available with IPMI and how you would do it with Redfish, and that causes your your uh, um, lateral transfer across. So the functionality is there. The one that we don't have I is, is the implementation of but that. But but that in and of itself is insufficient because you still want to be able to respond to an IPMI call, right? An IPMI get statement. I don't. <laughs> okay. I'm not trying to yeah. Say I, uh, what I mean by that is I actually never wanted to support IPMI, even though we can get to that. Uh huh. But I couldn't get away yeah. with it because I didn't have oh, yeah. a non-proprietary. A non-proprietary thing already, right? Like I have this REST thing; it's great, I love it, but it's not Redfish. And people looked at me and said, "Like, wait, you don't support IPMI, and you have a proprietary interface. You're not supporting Redfish? No. And that, and that right there, I had to support IPMI. But I don't. It, you don't. I don't really think you need to support IPMI if you just had a fully fledged Redfish implementation." That's, that's what I. Well, that's actually what I want to say. Right. Facebook is turned off because of security concerns. I think. How about? Yeah, I think they didn't choose between IPMI. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Excellent feedback. So if we, I'll ask the Intel, Microsoft guys, from your perspective, you know, big hyperscale operators could, well, Microsoft, could you turn off IPMI? And you have. Yes. Right now. That the 
Yep. Okay. Okay. And I think you guys have a really good view of, of you know the, the industry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Is it, we are cannot. We? Yeah, I mean, I have I have ten thousand customers. Today. Unique yeah. customers to serve. So uh, not just one Microsoft or one Google or one Facebook. Yeah. We have, okay. You know, we have thousands of customers, and they all have different requirements, and and they all need ISVs, and the ISVs haven't yet adopted completely Redfish. A lot of them are still IPMI. So, okay, so if we so took I, a, I can't. Right. So if we took a tack that we're going we to also don't do OCP, so. that we're going to have a, an OCP profile, which is predominantly, you know, uh, the properties that we have, you know, the 115 properties, maybe plus a few extras. What do you do then for, or what does anyone do that has that ha that needs to support IPMI? Just independent, right? I mean, it's independent support, independent support statement. Right, it's an independent demon running. It's my my, it's independent. Do, or not do we need demon. do we need to do the same? I, from with, the profile perspective, I don't think you do because that's a that's a redfish thing. Yeah, I know. That, and, and so, is there I, another is there another standard or another document that we have to use to describe the the record? Our, our customers call it 2.0. I mean, they, they you know they they basically say okay. every tender I read from a customer says, "Do you support my 2.0?" Well, that's. If that's it, then that that may be yeah, sufficient. I, feel like I, I, I don't want to proliferate its existence. With yeah, it. yeah. But I think more importantly, if there was something that was an IPMI that you know that, that like, and it's exactly it's from a vendor is exactly what it's used. She's like, do you have IPMI two uh -huh. Okay, we're done. But if he's like, oh, I wanted the the you know o seven seven three dash seven you know subcommand like, no, sorry, I don't have it. Where well, are you going to add that? Nope. Yeah, my my, my fear here is that that um, you know IPMI you know we're good. It's been like you said, 98, 2000. Um, but more and more tenders are coming in with, hey, we need Redfish. And and what I'm hearing here is you guys are going to start creating some profiles. Now, OCP aside, standard 1U, 2U box, is there going to be a profile there? And our, and that scares me because now you've started to, because today I can say, yeah, we support Redfish. I mean, we, we have right. one schema we could claim we support right. Redfish. Um, we have more than one. Don't worry, John. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but but I you start to I mean I like the idea of these profiles because now I can finally start saying what that means. Right. Because a lot of those schemas don't apply to my exactly. compute systems. Yeah. And more and more that's going to become the case. And, and there's going to be air conditioners in there. <laughs> and so I, I love the idea of profile, but it also kind of scares the crap out of me because you guys are going to start defining profiles that maybe don't we don't meet. <sighs> right. Yeah. And and. and and that's why we want this to be a very inclusive process. Number one, it's like, yeah, I'm not looking to, you know, I don't think. It, well, number one, if 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 the profile becomes so obtuse, then you know, no one's going to ask for it, and no one's going to support it. So it's a, it's pointless. And so you know, and I, and that's a lot of wasted work. So I don't want to do that. But like I said, you know, but we have so separate from OCP, but just as the DMTF and the Redfish community, we have a lot of people tr are all in the same bucket as the what do I support, how do I do it. Mm -hmm. And honestly what they're looking at today, they go to our they go to our uh, our resource explorer on the website and look at what's implemented there and what we call the basic server, you know, mock up and they implement that. And oh by the way, it's about the basic it's all the same. It all came from the same stuff guys. I mean this is but, you know this is not a Well we have to separate the type of profiles, right? The ones that DMTF has are aspirational in that in that we have all these additional uh, modeling elements yeah. we would like people to use right. and this is how we would define the profile. But the DMTF has learned they're very good at being a descriptive body, right? And and but there are, there's also prescriptive profiles which have money behind them because they show up in tenders and RFPs, right? Yeah. So what what the OCP would have are what I call prescriptive profiles, right? What can, what has to be their mandatory? Yeah. And what the DMTF has is descriptive profiles, which is aspirational in that if you want to do an air conditioner, right? This is the profile you want to have, yeah. but there's no monetary reason for people people go off and do that other than yeah ours, a, ours are going to look a lot lower lift with a lot more recommended right. and a lot less required other than it's a, it's a hard target for people to go exactly. look at until the TTG or someone else says no we'll tell you exactly what the, what type of profile to do for a new conditioner because we have all, all the SMEs that, in, in our organization and, and all of us work for very large companies with hundreds of different products and half of them won't meet them either so it's you know we're, we're very mindful of that concept too <laughs> We already know that the IPMI 
we have had some challenges because sometimes you want to introduce new proprietary or information that the standard doesn't support. Then you have to create lots of OEM command. So actually, if you're a DMTF they, member, bring, bring, send those right, emails. Then that, that affects the interoperability with the, the platform. It, so when we are talking about the Redfish, we are talking about because we have multiple interfaces. We have yep. the out-of-band, yep. we have in-band. So Redfish is just for out-of-band. No, no, we have a we have host interface now as well. That's that's that was that spec was published earlier this year. Okay, for inbound. Yes, yeah, for, uh, using a US, uh, using a a, a, a a system NIC interface. So it's okay. it's exact same tool set. Yeah. So yeah, for, not, for us, uh, the auto not, not a lot of implementations of that yeah. yet, but it's the, the, the Redfish, but inbound because they actually, Intel is defining the, all this in, in-band interface as IPMI, we have, we have to live with that. So we cannot get rid of that part, but out of band, yeah. Well, we'll talk to those guys, but it's yeah. a, so, yeah. so, Ali, how, how much a 